Live from the Emerald City in Seattle, Washington, the UFO, Bigfoot, and Paranormal Hotspot of the Pacific Northwest, coming directly to you listening in around the world. This, my friends, is Spaced Out Sunday. I am your host, Michael W. Hall, the Paranormal Lawyer, occupying the captain's chair tonight for SOR headquarters. We welcome you to tonight's show, including all of our listeners on the digital side at Revolution Radio. And don't forget, you can always find us uh, on, find our archives uh, for free at any time at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do us all a favor and hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to some Bumblefoot, shopping at our Spaced Out Radio store, and catching up on the SOR Newswire, and so much more. Tonight's show is brought to you by Chive Charities. Help make the world 10% happier by donating to Chive Charities today. You can find them on our website. Tonight, of course, we have uh, Peter Davenport again for the first half hour of Spaced Out Sunday. We are going to enjoy sighting reports from around the world and some some hot ones that just happened, I believe, Peter says, uh, within uh, uh, the last few hours of last night. Uh, Then, of course, we're going to have our... Our, well, some of our favorite guests are coming back on tonight. We've got Michael Kopsinski and Jared Murphy, and they're going to come back on and talk everything about all sorts of stuff. Time travel, paranormal, uh, aliens that might be us. Who knows? We've got a lot of stuff that we're going to talk about tonight on Spaced Out Sunday. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. And let's see if we've got everybody on the line. First of all, uh, do we have uh, Michael and Jared on? Yes, we do. Yep, I'm here. All right. Make sure you speak up well, you guys, uh, so we can get your audio uh, a little bit higher. And then, uh, Peter, are you, you there? Peter is here. Okay, you too, Peter. you got to get a little closer to the microphone, I think, and then we'll be okay. How does it sound now? Is that better? Yeah, that's, uh, that's good. I'm going to turn the general gain up a little bit more to get us all up there okay well um um michael kopsinski and jared murphy uh again let me welcome you to our good buddy uh peter davenport from the national ufo reporting center uh you two guys and myself get to kind of co-host peter for the first half hour of tonight's show because we've got some late breaking uh, sighting reports from uh, UFO, UAP around the world, I understand. So, Peter, how you doing out there in the western wilds of eastern Washington? Freezing to death. <laughs> I, I understand. It's getting, well, you know what? Boise, Idaho just got their first snow a few hours ago. I remember seeing someone, well, actually it was my cousin. My cousin Linda lives out in Boise, and she posted up the first snow of the season. Well, I'm sure we're not far behind them. Yeah. We'll probably wake up to snow tomorrow morning, Monday morning. Oh, I'll bet. Yeah, it could could be in a, in a vengeance. And, and my, my son Cameron is telling me that uh, in his perusals of the um, uh, the Farmer's Almanac, he, he just is fascinated with that thing. He's a young kid, but he likes this old Farmer's Almanac. He says it could be a tough winter this this winter. A shiver just went up my spine, Michael. <laughs> yeah. Uh, me, it is a harsh winter. Oh, no. We After all we've gone through, holy mackerel. And it ain't over yet. Who knows what's going to happen in the next few months. But uh, uh, let's uh, let's just give you full reign here, Peter. Tell us uh, what's going on with uh, these latest sighting reports. Well, there are always reports, and I should preface by saying I did a partial update of the ufocenter.com website last Thursday, two, three days ago. So there are a lot of relatively recent sightings. We've got 700 more sightings that are piled up in queue waiting to be proofread and posted. But I have four really very recent, very cogent, very convincing reports just from the last three nights, three days. 
Uh, first one I'd like to share with our audience comes from Truro, Iowa. That's spelled T R U R O. It's about 20 miles south of Des Moines in central Iowa. A gentleman wrote, submitted a report on behalf of his mother and his sister, who told him a story uh, last Friday morning. They recounted to him that they were out for their <coughs> traditional 6 a.m. early morning walk when they became aware of a very strange looking metallic in appearance cylindrical shaped object that was zigzagging across the sky in very very broad turns and uh, at a high rate of speed and it took it took the object only a few seconds he reports to cover the most of the sky when suddenly it slowed down dramatically and turned back headed the way it had come from and it moved across the sky at a much slower rate giving the mother and his sister an opportunity to see it even better the second time and it had one red light and one white light on it uh, they don't describe or the the reporter doesn't describe where the lights were on the object but it sounds very bizarre and he's a very very clear writer he's eloquent and uh grammatically correct that's always a plus for me yeah um wow so, true true Truro, iowa i don't know how to pronounce that but it's t-r-u-r-o true row huh yeah, I had trouble with that too, Michael. <laughs> wow. But he, he goes on to describe how they recounted to him that after it had moved across the sky going one direction at high speed and then turned around and moved back to where it had come from at slow speed, it went behind a cloud and just they were hoping it would come out again so they could see it a third time. But it just disappeared behind the cloud. Doesn't seem reminiscent of a terrestrial aircraft, in my opinion. A very good sighting report. Oh, Is yeah. Is there video of that? Say again? Is there video of that? I uh, didn't get a video, unfortunately. And while we're on that point, I would like to encourage our, any of our listeners who in the future see what they think might be a ufo uh i don't know if that was jared or michael who said that but it's important to get photographic evidence even with a cell phone camera it's better than nothing but yeah it, at I least at least you get you know for instance with a cell phone camera even if you don't pick up the image very well um there's a lot of metadata that can be taken off of that photograph you know, a direction, azimuth, all that kind of stuff. That's a good point, Michael. And in fact, it's a really good point because most people don't know where north is and they can't distinguish north from a common garden slug. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and, you know, people think that they know what north is in their own neck of the woods, their own neighborhood. And, uh, they're not that accurate in some cases, but... All you got to do is snap a photo in the direction, if you can get pretty pinpointed, the direction of this stuff. And and then we got uh, a little bit of, a, you know, metadata that we can analyze. A lot of people don't realize that when you uh, take a photo on, on an iPhone or any kind of a smart, smart uh, phone or tablet, um, and then you transfer it to a laptop or a desktop computer, when you right-click on the photos off the camera roll, there is a whole lot of data that's on that camera for every photo. Yeah, that's a good point, Michael. Mm. That data is very useful to an investigation. Yeah. Matter of fact, folks don't even really know a need to know how to do that. They just need to... Um, you know, send the raw data, the photograph, uh, via email to someone like Peter Davenport. Uh, and then on his end, um, he can open it up and click, right-click on his, uh, his desktop and find out a whole bunch of stuff in the drop-down menus 
anyway, just something to think about when you're out there with your phone. Because most people kind of get discouraged. They go, well, it's not going to turn out well. But, hey, take a picture anyway. Yeah, exactly. Although, I have to say I'm disappointed in most of the photos. I would say that easily 95% or so of the photographs sent to the National UFO Reporting Center are ambiguous. That's the most polite word I can use. <laughs> uh, yeah. They're just unconvincing. If people always uh, it will take a photo of a tiny speck of light against a dark background or conversely a dark object against a daytime sky and they, they assert that it's a UFO that is an alien spaceship but it's very difficult to translate a speck into an alien spacecraft. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, although the only saving grace nowadays is now that the cameras are becoming so sophisticated, you know, on the back of people's phones with the multiple lenses and those kinds of things, the the pixel resolution is getting much better anyway. Uh, hopefully that will help us in the future. I hope so. <laughs> Yeah. Well, we've interrupted you already, Peter, so go ahead. Keep going. Well, another report I'd like to share comes from the Portland, Oregon area, Gresham, the city of Gresham, which is just on the outskirts of Portland. This comes from Friday night, the 7th of, make that Saturday night, the 7th of uh, November. At 8.20 p.m., a gentleman who implies that he's never seen a UFO before was out admiring the night sky with his girlfriend and their attention was drawn to a very bright light, intensely bright light somewhere near the Portland, Oregon airport and at first because of their proximity to that airport he assumed that it was a an airliner, uh, the landing light on an airliner but it suddenly descended very rapidly and that's when they could see that it was not an airliner at all, he writes, but rather a triangle, a triangular shaped object with a light in each corner. They could actually see the craft, he implies. So this is, uh, he doesn't offer evidence. He didn't get a photograph, unfortunately, but again, a nicely prepared report. And nicely prepared reports go a long way with me well yeah and and coming from the portland international airport area oh my word you know that that's of course uh the summer of the saucers where it all started down there in portland um even before roswell that was like a major i remember uh my our, our good buddy vince inzunza did a, a documentary on the summer of the saucers out of portland and there were hundreds and hundreds of sightings there uh, before the Roswell incident, um, right down in that neck of the woods. So, gosh. I'm not surprised. Uh, and a point I'd like to throw out just generally for the benefit of our audience, it may shock a lot of people. My estimate, Michael, is that out of somewhere between 10,000 and 20,000 events in which the percipient sincerely believed that he or she had seen a, a bona fide UFO, uh, that is an alien spacecraft, out of 10,000 to 20,000 of those sightings, only one of those sightings will ever be captured by all of ufology, principally because people are shy about reporting them, it appears to me. Yeah. That is, I don't know. I can understand why they wouldn't want to go to uh, a newspaper and have their names published in the headlines. But, of course, we don't do that. As you know, Michael, we guard people's privacy aggressively. And we don't share name, address, phone number, or any personal data about the people who contact our center. Right. Well... And here, here's this, the even more shocking statistic that I, I think people need to uh, understand is that uh, if indeed only one in 20,000 
sightings are reported to any UFO agency like the National UFO Reporting Center. Uh, let's think how many reports you get on an annual basis, Peter, which which could be what? Generally, how many reports are you actually posting? Oh, about 6,000 to 8,000. Can you, even a little bit more than that. Can you imagine, let's just say even if it was 10,000, and then you can multiply that that by 20,000 more that aren't reported that are being cited all over the world. It's amazing how many people... Uh, in that, you know, when you extrapolate that data out, are seeing things. Yeah. Of course, my number is an estimate. Yeah. Of course. Uh, I don't think it can be more than one out of a thousand sightings. For example, the my first sighting, as you know, and we've discussed this on air, Michael, was in 1954 at a drive-in theater on the edge of the St. Louis airport. I presume there must have been thousands of people, certainly hundreds of people in that airport or in that drive-in theater who saw the same thing that I did that scared the daylights out of me. And yet there's only one report from the St. Louis airport for July of 1954. So yeah, that gives us a sort of a baseline figure. Oh, yeah. Oh, it would be in a drive-in theater for a major production movie. Uh, 500, maybe 1,000? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Especially back in the 50s. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Another report I'd like to share while we still have a little time. Yeah. This comes from this morning in the central time zone. Columbia, Alabama. The gentleman says, describes that he was out walking at nine, this is nine minutes past midnight, Central Standard Time, on Sunday morning, the, the 8th of November, and he saw a light zigzagging across the sky. And he was very close to the Farley nuclear plant. I don't know where that is, except to say it must be very close to Columbia, Alabama. And it, as he watched it, trying to figure out what it was, it suddenly slowed and came to a stop. Uh, this is not unusual. But then equally suddenly it started to accelerate and it streaked out of his vision. I talked to this gentleman tonight. He's very convincing. And he estimates that from the stopped position in the morning sky or evening sky, it disappeared from his sight in under five or six seconds. So it really accelerated and disappeared from his sight. This is the type of report that makes me wonder whether the UFO phenomenon might be coming to some kind of head, coming to some kind of resolution. Yeah, um, or out of the closet or something, uh, because they're just, they're being blatant about it now. Yeah. They are, and whereas I may have shared this with our audience in the past during past programs, but uh, it used to be the case that most sightings were just of lights, lights in the distance. But over the last several years, that there's been a change, and people are actually seeing palpable craft with the lighting on them. It's not just a blur of light, but rather a, an object. <clears throat> discrete, distinct lights on it. Yeah. Uh, obviously, that means that uh, they're seeing them closer uh, and closer as well. Not just uh, lights, you know, darting uh, through the heavens. They're getting, you know, like you, the, the one out of uh, uh, Portland International, a triangle shape with lights on the corners. You know, oh, my gosh. This is yeah. fascinating stuff. And I often wonder... It, the way these things maneuver, uh, and they seem to, you know, the sightings that you always give us, Peter, are so dramatic. You wonder if these craft have an ability to know who's watching them and be, being able to put on some kind of a show that's dramatic for the people that are there. You, it's just unusual. Yeah. 
not only I, but many other investigators in the UFO phenomenon, the UFO field, have wondered exactly the same. And I can think of a lot of specific cases in which that would be the logical conclusion based on what uh, witnesses had to report to investigators. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and you know uh, us at the UFO I team, Peter, we have actually got videotape of us asking uh, certain uh, lighted objects to sky to flare up, and they have done it for us repeatedly up to three and four times on tape. Uh, so it is, who knows if they're actually listening to us? Yeah, that's remarkable. Yeah. Well, listen, uh, you, you guys, uh, we are at the bottom of the hour and have to go to our our break here. But let me uh, let me try something unique here. I don't know about uh, Michael or Jared. What do you guys think of having Peter come back for uh, 15 more minutes on the other side of the hour? If you would like, Peter, or if you want to cut it, uh, cut it short at this point and get some rest, let, let us know that as well. I'd be happy to just hang on for another 15 minutes or so. We'll give Michael and Jared an opportunity to, to take pot shots at me. <laughs> Is that all right, you guys? That's fine with me. Cool. Well, I, I, got, I got plenty of questions, so that sounds great. All right. Good for you guys. All right. Well, let's do this. Let's go and take our, our break, and we will re be right back with Spaced Out Sunday after this. Hey, Spaced, Spaced Out, Out Radio, Radio fans. fans. It's, it's John, John Reza, Reza, founder, founder of the Chive and Chive Charities. Our goal is to make the life of veterans, first responders, and those with rare medical conditions 10% happier. We do this by donating one grant item, ranging from dance to therapy programs to prosthetic limbs, to those who need it most. To contribute to Spaced Out Radio's official charity, head, head over, over to chivecharities.org and become a donor. Oh, you guys, we're live. you got to be quiet during the break. I'm feeling a little spicy tonight. What to do, what to do. Why not get Bumblefoot? Four million Scoville units of pure hard rock. Bumblefoot hot sauces come in three flavors. The burning Bumblef***. Tone it down a bit with Bumblelicious and throw the sauce on everything. Spice it up. Bumble me, baby. Bumblefoot hot sauce. Get it today at kajons.com. At spacedoutradio.com. We are keeping you up to date on all the news with the SOR Newswire. Captain Shirk leads the team that is bringing you the news of the day and exclusive stories on everything paranormal and supernatural. It's free to read, it's updated daily, and it's right there for you. The SOR Newswire is a one-stop shop for the news of the day. Check it out at spacedoutradio.com today. Are you looking for great advertising value for your company? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. We have a multitude of places to get your name out there, including commercial ads during the show, special promotions, and banners on our website. Our audience is proven to support the companies that support our show. We can make your budget work for you. So for more information, please contact us at sales at spacedoutradio.com. Hey everybody, the SOR Space Travelers is open. For just five bucks a month, you can hang out with Dave and our crew privately in our members only section. With your signing, you'll receive newsletters on what's going on with Spaced Out Radio. You'll have direct contact with the host during the show in our chat, live streaming videos, and a great form for your posts and more. Become a space traveler now at spacedoutradio.com. Are you addicted to the woo? Good, me too. This is Dave Scott, and you can woo it up with me every Monday through Friday, starting at 9.06 Pacific, 12.06 a.m. Eastern, for three hours of great entertainment in the subjects you love. UFOs, ghosts, cryptids, intuition, yes, we hit it all five days a week. Look for us at spacedoutradio.com, where together, my friends, we own the night.
You wanted new SOR gear and now you can have it. The SOR Vault is fully stocked with t-shirts, hats, hoodies, mugs, and everything in between with great logos for you to choose from. So head on over to spacedoutradio.com, click on the SOR Vault, and go shopping. Pricing is quite affordable and you can look good representing your favorite show. So go to our website and pick up your new SOR wear at the SOR Vault today. Need that weekend supernatural fix? Look no further than Spaced Out Saturday right here at spacedoutradio.com. I'm Stacy Edwards. And I'm John Edwards. Each Saturday night, Stacy and I are going to bring you the best in paranormal, cryptids, UFOs, you name it, and we're going there. It's all about the experience and to share the knowledge with all of you. So tune us in every Saturday night on Spaced Out Saturdays starting at 9.06 p.m. Pacific, 12.06 a.m. Eastern, only at spacedoutradio.com. From the heartlands of Canada to beards around the world, we know how to take care of you. Fill your follicles with the Mighty Moose Beard Oil. All our oils and balms are handmade and 100% natural ingredients because we care about your beard. And hey, use the promo code SOR2019 and get your Mighty Moose Beard Oil today. You can check us out on our website, MightyMooseBeard.com. We're adding to the entertainment online for Spaced Out Radio. I'm Amber Beckard, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out Cryptid Tales, where I will take you on a journey into some of the strangest legends and lore from around the world, relaying the stories to you of the strange creatures and experiences that people have had throughout time. You can find Cryptid Tales at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. And while you're there, don't forget to check out our free archives and leave a comment. See you there. Cold drinks, great food, and the best music in Vancouver. The Moose Vancouver is the place to be, open until 2 a.m. nightly. Everything on the menu starts at just $6.95. Who serves food that cheap anymore? At the Moose, you'll never know who you'll run into. Rock stars, actors, athletes, it's the place everyone wants to be. So join us at the Moose Vancouver, the Moose Vancouver, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. Hello everyone, this is Ryan Stacy from the Experiencer Support Association, otherwise known as TESSA. We're glad to team up with Spaced Out Radio to help investigate your experiences on the SOR Sightlines Report. Together, we'll investigate the strange sightings and occurrences you've had. We're looking for answers just like you. So fill out a Sightlines Report on the Spaced Out Radio website and let's figure out what's going on together. And now we're back again on Spaced Out Sunday. Welcome back, everyone. Hope you're enjoying yourselves uh, during these interesting times that we're living in out here uh, as the holidays approach as well. <laughs> oh, man, I think I think uh, when the uh, big uh, silver ball or whatever that crystal ball drops in Times Square ending 2020, I think a lot of us are going to be very celebratory at Tory at that point. Hopefully things will be settled down by then. But uh, welcome back, uh, Peter. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Great. Yeah, and uh, Michael Kapsinski, Jared Murphy. Are you guys there? I'm yeah. here. Nice. Okay. Um, well, listen. Before we get started, I appreciate you uh, allowing us to hold Peter over for a few more minutes here. Um, I figured it'd be uh, appropriate if you guys had any strange questions to ask the infamous Peter Davenport. This is your chance, so go ahead. Well, I, I just want to say something about the end of 2020, and all I have to say is, what if it's not 2020, but 2020s? Ooh, what a scary thought, huh? Yeah, and what if, uh, <laughs> we're going to talk about this later, but what if what if they are us? <laughs> <laughs> oh my 
Yeah. Oh my goodness. Okay. Oh, my. That's one of the reasons I find the UFO phenomenon so worthy of investigation because a lot of those questions may be answered when we discover the relationship between us and these presumed aliens who occupy these craft called UFOs. Yeah. Yeah, these uh, these two paranormal podcasters that we've got on tonight, Peter, Michael, and Jerry, we're going to be talking about that uh, and various theories about who the heck they are. Yeah. Uh, that'll be a very interesting, but um, uh, we, we we did inter- interrupt you. I know you, you had some some uh, historic sighting reports you wanted to mention as well. Yeah, I'd just like to close off the report that I was discussing before the break from Columbia, Alabama, the sighting in the vicinity of Farley Nuclear Plant. One of the things I wanted to mention and are discussing the ships, visible palpable ships, last sex- session uh, brought this to mind. The the witness reports that as the object suddenly accelerated and shot off, again, as I mentioned, that took, he estimates, six seconds from a stationary position to gone over the horizon. He said it left a double stripe of bright blue and bright red light behind it. Oh! Uh, could have been a visual effect, uh, leaving a lasting image on the red of the percipient of the witness. But that's an interesting uh, fact to the sighting, I thought. Yeah. And one more sighting I'd like to share. It occurred just about less than an hour after the sighting in Columbia, or Columbia, Alabama. A sighting in Visalia, California. This is last night at 2300 hours or 11 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, three witnesses report that they were outside admiring the night sky as people often do and they saw a cluster of what they estimated to be 10 white circular round objects that were maneuvering very in a very complex fashion in the night sky and they were some of them were actually seen allegedly to be circling one another they were swirling around the sky and uh, how there can be a sighting of this nature as blatant as what these witnesses imply and are not getting more reports goes back to the subject we were discussing michael about how few people report their UFO sightings or sightings of strange events, let's call them for now. Oh, my. Yeah. Ten, ten round objects swirling around each other um, at 11, 11 p.m. That would get your attention, that's for sure. Yep. I have, a, I have a question about that. Did it have one larger object kind of in the center of them? Or were they all the same size? If they did, I'm not aware of it. Uh, the witnesses did not include that in their in their uh, report. But what I think I see where you're going. Is that Jared or Michael who posed the question? It was Michael. Michael. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, this didn't have anything to do with the so-called Starlink satellites, of which we are getting many reports now no i I was actually just i was actually going towards uh the the, a mothership oh yes oh he doesn't address that issue and as is often the case we encourage people to submit written reports with all the details but unfortunately we don't always get what we ask for and uh there are many questions that I would like to be able to ask these people about their sighting to fill in the, the blank spots. Yeah. Well, and we keep uh, we keep threatening to ask these people to come on the air with you at one point. So if, if anyone does show that interest, uh, we'll ask them questions directly. That would be interesting. Well, I'd love to do that. We'll do that in future weeks, Michael. Oh, wonderful. That would be fun for us to... Uh, look forward to during the long winter season of uh, people that might be interested in 
you know, coming directly on the show with you. So, yeah. yeah. All well, right. Sightings from the past. I'd like to share one with our audience, maybe two. First one comes from Eklitna, Alaska. That used to be a village. It's now a small town just east of Anchorage in Alaska. This takes us back uh, to October 1936, 84 years ago. Uh, this gentleman called me from Seattle. He's a very interesting guy. I've forgotten his name now, but he called and called me and called the hotline in about the year 2000 or maybe earlier. And he described a situation that he experienced as a young lad. I think he was 18 years of age at the time. He had been hired to work as a carpenter at a CCC camp, a Youth Conservation Corps camp in Clinton, and they worked six days a week. The only day they had off was Sunday. And he was in the habit in October of 19, this is 1936 again, he was in the habit of taking off after work closed on Saturday night and hitchhiking the 20 or 25 miles into Anchorage. You have a night on the town and he told me he used to sleep in the jail They'd go out drinking and <laughs> prevail upon the local constabulary to allow them to sleep in the jail. On this particular Saturday night, they left their CCC camp, and they were hitchhiking to the west towards Anchorage, and they became aware of a blue light that was approaching them from the west. And they were thrilled because... They didn't have proper clothing to be out hitchhiking uh, in October weather in Alaska. And as the object got closer, their alarm grew because it, they quickly realized, whereas they first thought it was a truck approaching them with one headlight out, they quickly realized that it was something else. And they couldn't explain the blue color to the light either. And before they knew it, a craft was directly above them. It was shaped like the bottom of a flat iron and it just hovered above them. It scared the daylights out of them to the extent that they both jumped into a snowbank and covered themselves with snow, raising the possibility of a possible, uh, possible abduction scenario. But once the object left, they ran all the way back to the camp. They didn't want to have anything to do with the Anchorage after that experience. How many more reports there are of that nature that could be told? God only knows. But this, again, this is from 1936, 11 years before Roswell. Oh my, Peter! And this is this is well before Norman Muscarello and the incident at Exeter that you covered as well. Yep. It's very similar to it. And I mention these cases principally because I find cases from decades past and even centuries past every bit as interesting, if not more so, than reports of what happened just last night. So, yeah, yeah, that uh, the same, uh, and these, these were young gentlemen, you're saying, right? Probably in their 20s or teens or something, right? Teenagers, I think. Yeah. Um, it's it's very similar to that uh, young Norman Muscarello guy hitchhiking on the highway uh, back in the 19, uh, that was uh, 50s, right? 65. 65, and then getting, getting buzzed by a UFO and having to dive into the ditch on the side of the road as well. I mean, holy mackerel. Yep. I don't think we've even begun to scratch the surface in our understanding of what the UFO phenomenon is and how it manifests itself. We're dealing with a real phenomenon. It's a, a frequent event, and uh, we have a government that has decided that we're not to know anything about it. Yeah, yeah, it is fascinating. And now they're... Uh... There seems to be some cracks in the dam of disinformation 
where the DOD and the Department of Def- I mean the Navy and Pentagon are actually confirming certain things. You know it's going to be very interesting, uh, and Michael and Jared will be uh, agreeing with me on this, as I'm sure. When the uh, UAP task force, you know, that's been set up by the uh, Senate Select Committee, when they actually come out with a report, you know, and actually uh, look into this, it's going to be interesting to see how the public reacts to um, the actual government now claiming that these things are real. Yeah. I'm looking forward to that announcement. Now, I, I, I know we're running out of time. I know Jared had some questions for Peter. Uh, uh, Jared, do you want to ask your questions? Oh, yeah, thanks. If uh, Well, unless you can stay on a little bit longer, unless you got to go. You know what, what? Why don't we stay to the top of the hour, you guys? we got about uh, eight more minutes if you want. Oh, well, then we'll start with, I, I want to prioritize my questions because I could just keep asking. So, um, yeah, so nice to meet you. I uh, spent four years on a book called It's Not Aliens, Worse, It's Us, Discovering Our Lost History. And it's about, part of it is, why do we see all these UFOs? Are they really from somewhere else? Or is there a possibility that an ancient advanced human race actually survived multiple catastrophes and these advanced craft are actually uh, basically a group of humans that just continue to call this place home, just like we do, just like we leave 150 tribes alone around the planet, and that there's a possibility that these UFOs are not from somewhere else, that they are remnants of an advanced human race. But that's my, that's, that's for another time. More importantly, I was hoping you could, I would like you to describe if you have, uh, if you can, the uh, uh, most detailed and interactive, verified uh, encounter that you know of. That was my first question. <laughs> encounter between humans and aliens? <laughs> yeah, well, just, yeah, any of the ones, because I know your frustration, I agree. It's like, you know, you get these fuzzy <clears throat> documentations or there's like no video or nobody wants to talk about it because I've met the same people. I, I, I won't out him, but I know a very smart engineer that, I mean, this guy's as straight-laced and not into any of this, and he and his friends in the late 50s saw a whole squadron, squadron of, of UFOs that were directly above their head. They were 12 years old. This is not the kind of guy that, this is a very credible, incredibly stoic sort of gentleman that is now retired that will swear up and down that he and his friends were off to a baseball field in the late 50s and they they stood terrified while they watched eight saucers above their head did not move stayed above them not for a second but for approximately 15 minutes and so there's i think there's cases like this where is it a military ufo is it an advanced uh military craft from a government but then there you know it's the united states military itself coming out and michael's talked about this and we've talked about this and conflict radio's talked about this there's actual not military ufos so who are they but i think it matters when you get these reports who these people uh it's not even who they are to qualify but i think there's too many uh smart and and people who are you know they weren't into ufos they weren't into they have nothing to do with any conspiracies they just they keep encountering these vehicles all over the planet and I think these detailed accounts that happen, I think there's little slivers of the puzzle that we could piece all together. So it's just, that was my first thing that I had in my mind. And then the, I guess I will say one more thing and then let you answer, which was the, the follow-up question then is, is there any pattern to the more detailed sightings that you can tell or have heard of? Well, there, I'll address the last question. There are no patterns that I can detect possible exception of uh, the orange and red lights that have been reported to the National UFO Reporting Center for the last eight years. That's a new development, or it was eight years ago. Uh, With regard to whether they were or are military craft, I seriously question that, but I don't know for sure. It's one of the many unanswered questions that we constantly field in ufology. But if their craft being generated, being built and operated by 
the world's military, uh, why would, I ask rhetorically, why would they be testing them or even flying them above a baseball field or above a, a neighborhood? So it's hard for me to imagine that they are coming from this planet, but it's a good question, and a good question in and, the sense that I don't have an answer for it. And and you guys, I don't know if you uh, uh, know this, but uh, the Phoenix Lights incident uh, was one of the m more you know documented uh, sighting reports uh, ever. Uh, Peter was the one who broke that story. Um, so he, it, that, that is one of those kinds of things that if he, if, uh, I think Peter, if you were, uh, uh, you know, at, put in a corner and say, what, what's the best sighting report you've ever run across as far as being able to be actually involved in it was, could have been the Phoenix lights. Absolutely. It was the most dramatic, <clears throat> most well-documented case in the history of all modern ufology, in my opinion. And dramatic in the sense that, as you know, Michael, the size of the objects that were seen that night, this is the 13th of March, 1997, Thursday night, were immense. Uh, I calculate, based on evidence provided to me, that the object, at least one of the five or possibly six triangular-shaped craft was eight in excess of eight miles from wingtip to wingtip, eight terrestrial statute miles wide. And that's a pretty dramatic sighting. And we have reason to believe that uh, the U.S. military was elevated from a defense condition five, which is the lowest state of preparedness, skipping four altogether, going right to def DEFCON three. So the government must have been alarmed by it. And it goes back to my question or the question that Jared posed, could they be military? Well, uh, if they were our military at any rate, uh, I don't have any explanation for why the government would uh, raise its military preparedness to DEFCON 3. They would, know, would have known ahead of time that they were going to be there. Plus, the, the interesting thing that you point out, Peter, was that uh, President Clinton happened to be in Arizona at that very moment visiting um, uh, Greg Norman, right, the golfer. Yeah, he was in Florida, actually. Oh, Florida, I'm sorry. And they had spent the day golfing, and that was the night. I estimate that within seconds or at most minutes, of an intercept of one of these triangular craft over Camelback Mountain by the U.S. Air Force that President Clinton, that is when President Clinton allegedly injured his knee to the extent that he had to be spirited back to Washington, D.C. immediately for alleged surgery. Well, it's uh, not too difficult to for me to imagine how his sudden movements were probably caused by, certainly related to, uh, the Phoenix Lights case. You know, I'm going to jump in here for a second because I used to live in, in Phoenix, Arizona, and what I found fascinating about it, moving there and talking to people who witnessed it when I was living there, was that there was actually a humongous craft that traveled 50 feet above Highway 17 pretty much all the way from Flagstaff to Phoenix before the Phoenix Light incident even began. It was a massive craft that followed yeah. that followed the highway down, literally 50 feet off the highway, and I think that that's missed in a lot of the storytelling of the incident. Yeah. I'm not surprised by that. There are all sorts of stories that we didn't manage to capture from that event. I was not aware of that. If you know the person who saw the object, I would welcome a, welcome a written report. But that's an interesting story, Jared. And I understand uh, Dr. Dr. Lynn, uh, yeah, thanks, Michael. Dr. Lynn Katai was the one who put together some of those pre-Phoenix uh, uh, sighting uh, reports together and put into that documentary that she did. It was pretty awesome. Yeah. <clears throat> 
Well, Peter, uh, let's give your uh, your contact info for folks and the UFO hotline and get you out of here so you can get some rest tonight. Well, thank you for that. Thanks for the extra time to all three of you. Uh, if anybody sees a UFO and would like to talk to me about it, they can call me on the UFO hotline, which is area code 206-722-3000. That's 206 206- Seven two two three thousand. We've had that same number for forty six years now, and I invariably will request that people submit follow up written reports, and they can do that from our website at ufocenter.com. We have an online report form on our website. And if anybody would like to correspond via the postal service, our uh, postal address is PO Box seven hundred. Davenport, Washington, 99122. P.O. Box 700, Davenport, Washington, 99102. 99122, I'm sorry. 99122. And if there's uh, $5, $10 you want to send Peter's way, uh, please feel free to do that. My gosh, this guy is a one-man show, has been doing it for for decades, literally, answering that phone. So any help you can give would be wonderful. As always, thank you for the airtime, Michael. It's been delightful. All right, you guys. We're going to be back. Uh, by the way, you guys, our breaks are six minutes long, just so you know. Michael and, and Jared, and we're going to take uh, one right now at the top of the hour. We'll be back six minutes from now. And uh, during the uh, interim there, if you can mute your mics uh, so we don't bleed into the uh, bumper music, that'd be cool. We will be right back after this, folks. Looking for creative ways to get your company out in the public? How about advertising on Spaced Out Radio? Our sales department is waiting to hear from you, and we can work around any budget. From commercial spots to banners to special promotions, there are many opportunities to get your name and product out to our SOR listeners. For a price guide and more information, please contact us at sales at spacedoutradio.com. If you like it hot, real hot, then heat up your meals with Bumblefoot Hot Sauce. Get your Bumblefoot Hot Sauce today. The sauce, Bumblelicious, and the 4 million Scoville unit, Bumble, we're going in hot, real hot, coming out even hotter. Keep the milk nearby. And tantalize your taste buds tonight. Bumblefoot Hot Sauce, available now at kajons.com. Get your horns up with me on Spaced Out Radio. This is Ron Bumblefoot Thaw. Come tune in to SOR where you can hear me rock out with Little Brother Is Watching, the official theme song of Spaced Out Radio. And then come on over to Bumblefoot.com where you can find out about my tour schedule, my music, and everything else. Bumblefoot.com keeps you up to date on what I'm doing and the best way to stay in touch with my music and music camps. Sign up for my newsletter at Bumblefoot.com and remember, Little Brother Is Watching. Visit PurplePlates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at PurplePlates.com. The SOR Vault is open for business, and do we have some cool swag for you to pick up? All you have to do is head over to our website and click on the SOR Vault. You have a variety of cool logos to choose from, and put them on anything you want. T-shirts, hoodies, hats, coffee mugs, you name it, we can get it to you. So do your shopping by supporting the store you love. Get your Spaced Out Radio swag at the SOR Vault today. Hey everyone, I'm John Edwards. And I'm Stacy Edwards. Together we're taking over Saturday nights on Spaced Out Radio where we're going to bring our own experiences of the paranormal and talk to the best people we can find to help bring you answers to your strange tales. We're here to entertain your need for weekend. Woo! So tune us in at spacedoutradio.com starting at 9.06 Pacific, 12.06 a.m. Eastern where we can all get a little spooky together. Spaced Out Saturday nights right here at spacedoutradio.com. We are scouring the world for the most intriguing stories of your day. 
take the time to read up on the SOR Newswire, where our team, led by Captain Shirk, will deliver to you some of the best paranormal and supernatural news, along with some stories that will blow your mind from the weird to the wacky. It's the news outside the news that piques interest, and that's what we're looking to deliver to you. The SOR Newswire, only at spacedoutradio.com. We all know on Spaced Out Radio we love a good beard and mustache, so why not take care of your facial hair with Mighty Moose Beard Oil? Made in Canada, we're taking care of beards and stashes around the world. We use 100% natural ingredients with our oils and balms to make your whiskers feel silky smooth. Use promo code SOR2019 at MightyMooseBeard.com today. Hi, this is Amber Beckrud, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel where we store all of the SOR show archives for free. And as an added bonus, every two weeks, I'm posting brand new content on Cryptid Tales, where I will get into some of the spookier legends and folklore from around the world and tell the stories that go with them. Find us at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio and check out Cryptid Tales today. Drop a comment and let me know what you want to hear. See you there. Are you an experiencer of something strange that can't be explained? Do you want help finding out what's going on? I'm Ryan Stacy, head of the Experiencer Support Association, otherwise known as TESSA. We've teamed up with Spaced Out Radio to investigate cases filled out in the SOR Sightlines Report. We are independent, and there's no cost to what we do. All we need is your experience. Let's find out what's happening together on the SOR Sightlines Report. Hey, space travelers. This is John Resig, founder of the Chive and Chive Charities. If you know anything about our website, you know we like to do things a little differently. We're not some faceless organization collecting money for a nebulous cause. Our donor dollars go directly toward life-improving items. Then we give those items directly to an underdog who needs it most. To become a donor with Spaced Out Radio's official charity, Chive Charities, just go to chivecharities.org forward slash donate. For the price of one cup of coffee a month, you can become an SOR Space Traveler. The Space Travelers Club is a place where you can interact with other listeners, either live during the show or on our great forum. We want your stories, pictures, comments, and ideas. You'll get live video streams, exclusive content, and be a part of our newsletter. Stay in touch with everything SOR. The Space Travelers Club is just 5 bucks a month at spacedoutradio.com. Hi there, this is Dave Scott, and I'm bringing you the woo every Monday through Friday on Spaced Out Radio. I'm going all out to bring you the strangest, oddest stories and subjects I could find for your entertainment. Why? Because when we hit peak woo, I know I've done my job. So come tune us in at spacedoutradio.com, 906 Pacific, 1206 AM Eastern, and together, my friends, we own the night. Welcome back to our number two of Spaced Out Sunday. I am your host, Michael W. Hall, the Paranormal Lawyer. Thanks for joining me. We welcome back everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates, WQEE 99.1 FM in Noonan, Georgia, and UPRN 107.7 in New Orleans, Louisiana. And on the digital side, we are proud to be on Revolution Radio. Don't forget, you can always check out our archives for free at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do me a favor and hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to some bumblefoot, shopping at our spaced out radio store, and catching up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire, and so much more. We are... Uh, we are back here with, oh my goodness, the Paranormal Podcasters here, Michael Kopsinski and Jared Murphy of Conflict Radio. You guys, uh, thanks for uh, for hanging in there with me on the first uh, full hour, looks like we had, with Peter Davenport. Yeah, good times. Nice. Well, you guys uh, 
kind of uh, we we kind of got started on some of the topics we want to talk about tonight. Uh, and they kind of segued in there from uh, Peter's amazing reports around the planet um, uh, about uh, the bold sighting reports that are going on. And uh, you alluded to it, I think, uh, the idea that uh, who knows what these people are or if they are people or whatever. <laughs> Maybe we want to start talking about that. Yeah, well, but. Michael, what kind of questions you got? Well, that's what I was just going to ask. Because um, you've got this theory. I know you've got the theory of a time-traveling, um, you know, uh, uh, kind of like, what, what do they kind of call that? Uh, the race of folks that have um, uh, uh, gone on before us and done real well and then left the planet? Or did they just go to other planets to do their time traveling? Tell, tell us about the theory that you've come up with on your fan, fantastic book. So, well, I found, I was going to, I found engineered soil. It's called Terra Preta. It's a, a soil that isn't random decomposition of uh, whether it's trees and compost and what it really is is it's a soil that has to be engineered it's for growing it's the richest soil on earth it's found in brazil it's found in north africa it's found in australia and specifically it's the same formula and it's been tested it's it can easily be over six thousand years old and the reality is is what what are you doing with an identical soil in what is and definitely in that period what we're going to start calling prehistory and it's on three different continents where none of those should be connected let alone for nomadic people to be engineering soil to not just use the soil that's in the ground but to be engineering soil to create super great whether it's uh, filtering heavy metals whether it's growing really good nutrient rich soil it has piezoelectric properties, it has heavy metals and carbon dioxide and this ability to filter those things. So we're talking about a soil that's very unique and all over the earth, uh, when you mix that with what appears to be giant polygonal cymatic, you know, megalithic block construction, we're talking about a society that can manage frequencies and waves, can engineer soil, and the more I dug for four years, to me it appears that just like Michael Cremo in his book Forbidden Archaeology points out, the minute paleoanthropologists started looking, we found that anatomically correct humans have been here for many epochs of time, maybe even millions of years. And these are things that are not accepted uh, because only in the, like right now we did, we have a new computer, we have new cell phones, and we constantly look at technology and we always upgrade. But yet in the world of archaeology, in the world of history, in the world of what you go to college for, if, if you go to college, the, the reality is you're told a theory that was taught and was come up with approximately 120 to 150 years ago. And instead of going and letting the facts dictate the theories, the theories dictate the facts that are accepted. So we have this lens that blinds our theories to what the reality is, is that anatomically correct humans have been here for millions of years and the chances of them possibly for instance to your point settling the moon uh mars other locations within the solar system the idea that ancient high technology well past where we are currently a society that could have sent out satellites tens of thousands or thousands ten ten thousand years ago even in a very young epoch that there's a possibility that some of the signals that are coming back to Earth, that the, again, the UFOs that we're looking at are actually remnants of a human population that absolutely has the ability to affect their genetics, uh, manipulate their genes. And when we look at technology as an external device, these people based on engineered soil, based on uh, the DNA and the evidence of the different varieties of humanity living on this planet, like the Paracas of Peru, the elongated skulls that you find all over the earth, there's a good chance that just like we have 3D printers today that print hearts and lungs and uh, livers and ears, and there are 3D portable printers now, and we're printing objects, including biological, they, these people reached a level of technology where 
the machinery as we look at it would not be external. It's likely that what we look at as biological, it's really actually technology. So we mistake things in the natural world and within our own genome as natural. And in reality, that if you were doing zero point turns in some of these unidentified objects that we're seeing in space and time, that we think, well, they must be moving dimensionally, or they must be coming from a different time frame, or they must be moving between a dimensional space. But the reality is that we don't even have our heads around fully what the human body at 10 to 15% consciousness can do. But if you were an advanced human and you were moving a zero point turn, Mach 12, Mach 20, uh, all the things that have been seen is it possible that the organic uh, connection between larger eyes, the smaller body, translucent, where your skin itself is receiving and sending data and waves and frequencies, the technology we're looking at would look just very foreign, magical even. So these UFOs or unidentified objects could quite likely be based on the level of technology we have reachieved. It's hard to miss them. It's hard to miss looking in the sky and seeing that doesn't quite jive. That just doesn't look right. And you have too many people that aren't in the field of ufology or just interested in the paranormal or interested in this. And they're just seeing these objects everywhere like Phoenix. And you, there's no going around it. It's like these, these, these represent somebody on this planet with a technology beyond ours. And it's not military. It's not local governments as in continental governments that we know of on, on this planet, it it is a foreign technology, but the assumption has to be always, the, the paradigm we grew up in was, well, it's gotta be aliens. But that's a bigger leap, yeah. not that there aren't, than it is to say, well, look at all the technology of the ground, look at all the achievement of genetic technology, look at where we've been, and what do we have? We have the chance that not only was an advanced human society here locally, but could have made it to Mars, could have made it to the planetary system here and beyond. And at some point, clearly, it wasn't just a natural disaster that eliminated their existence on the globe as we see it. So th there's the long and short of the theory, since we haven't had a chance to talk about it on your show. I love it. I love it so much. Matter of fact, I'll bet you really loved um, the theme at the very end of the movie, uh, 2001 a space odyssey do you remember that old film it was an old film by kubrick but it was so uh far in advance of its time uh back when it was made the idea that uh this astronaut was uh literally being um kind of like scrutinized you know by a an off-world uh you know um uh race or whatever you want to call it uh and and turned into a star child uh remember at the end when he uh kind of looks like an embryo you know floating out in space and he does some amazing things that are um uh noted by the astronomers on the planet uh as a ufo coming back into the uh atmosphere himself when he is kind of graduated out out of his body and I would imagine that's kind of the similar thing that you're talking about, that uh, any advanced society that has the ability uh, to uh, transcend our, 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 our meat suits uh, is going to look like a UFO almost if we're, uh, you know, an entity uh, coming back into the Earth's atmosphere. Who knows? Yeah, and it's... Um... I think it helps take away, not take away, but actually adds to when you take away the filters of the paradigm that it's, okay, well, it's got to be a foreign entity. It does help us rediscover our past. It helps us rediscover, therefore, also our future because we're seeing these objects. We know they're here. So what what is the technology involved to create those things? But we aren't done identifying what megalithic construction is it is cymatic it has to do with waves and frequencies the ground itself when you go to engineered soil it's not just about growing uh food it's also about doing large uh 
the connectivity between the buildings and the structures, which we mistake for completed projects. Because again, if you're doing large, multi-sided, 100, 800 ton stones, 1,000 ton stones, it's not just their weight, it's the distance that they traveled, it's the number of sides, the complexity of the angles. These are not four-sided bricks like in a house today. These sometimes have 20 or 15 or 30 sides and they are irregular to the tune of 12 feet or eight feet wide and, and they have multi angles and they fit completely perfectly on every side. And it's because there's been measurements and data collected in ancient time that said, well, if an earthquake hits this building, it's going to do it from so many miles below the earth and in such a direction that if we build here, the building that we built has to look a certain way. And that's now mainstream science. We understand that this cymatic polygon blocking was done for that. But what has not been looked at frequently or much, as I pointed out in my book, was the idea of engineered soil, not just for growing, but having a background in historical remodeling and construction. One of the things that I thought about exactly was, it's it, the study of it today is called seismic meta structures. And these are objects that are as small as a nano size to basically structures that would also help deflect or mute, uh, resonate, uh, in fact, they call them wave resonators. So they not only either mute a particular wave frequency, but they also transmute, uh, relay, but you would combine this into the structure of a building. So part of this is for us to get back on the field, which I'm planning some trips, is to get the core sampling done under some of these megalithic structures because what we need to do is identify when you build a wall for a home, you know, you build, you pre-compact the foundation. And what that means is uh, for, I live in Minnesota. I know there are a lot of places in the South that although they could use some basements, some places don't because tornado alleys, you know, and when you build a basement, you build, uh, you dig down through the dirt or clay or sand, whatever is in your area. And then the first thing you do is pre-compact the ground. This sounds kind of boring, not sex. You know, not sexy like a mummy, but the idea is you pre-compact the soil, then you add in what is on most gravel roads, gravel, and you pound that down and then you put on cinder block or you build a form and you pour concrete and then you level a house. Well, most of us know that even if the house is oh, four years to 20 years, alone a hundred, we don't build things that stay level square or plumb or straight or anything for a very long time. Yet these megalithic structures no one's it hasn't really occurred to anyone to think okay well these structures are not only massive and you think well they're really heavy so they don't move it doesn't matter how big a sheet of any you know if it's a thousand ton block if it's on ice it's going to move if it's on sand it's going to you know tilt and without maintenance even at places like machu picchu uh there's a particular wall where they'll look at it with three windows and they'll say well there's been so many earthquakes and it finally shook itself out of its place, irrelevant to keystone cuts. The reality is that the foundation material, the core, all the way, whether is it, first off, how deep? When we build a foundational wall, it, it's only pre-compacted to about 12 or uh, two, two feet, basically. And it's maybe three materials. What if we get under these structures and down to the tiniest nanocrystal, it's a, it, what if it's like crushed quartz from a thousand miles away, just like the block is from maybe 300 miles away in a structure or a thousand miles away. What if the layers that support these structures, like the Giza Plateau, the actual power plant of the Giza pyramids, it's not just an exterior wall that's being supported. It's the entire surface of the structure that's being supported. And the question is, what are the foundational elements of these buildings? Because in it, along with genetic information like the Paracas, Denise events, Neanderthal. We always think that there's a lineal history. What about the genetic anomalies that show that there were multiple human races on this planet in antiquity, along with a high technology? They didn't just discover a smart way to build a foundation. These people were plowing ahead of the technology using things that whenever they fell and whatever catastrophe that hit them, when they recovered, what do we have? Well, we have all these dynastic uh, beliefs of whether it's uh, biblical accounts, Sumerian accounts, all the Gilgamesh and the Sumerian accounts of 
well, there was a flood coming and, and X, Y, and Z, and here's all the knowledge. And well, those are all post flood. These technologies lie in constructions that even including the Sphinx likely predate this, you know, this antediluvian period, pre younger drives, you know, 12,600 years ago. So we're talking about societies and I talk about it in the book that we're talking about people that definitely would have the technology to be flying around right now. And the follow up question, a lot of times is people say, well, why would they still be around here? And it's like, well, it's still home. It's, these are questions we'd like to table, but we're seeing them. They're, they're showing up. I mean, he just said, what was his average for, for unidentified, um, just a reported versus unreported? What was his average? 20,000? Yeah, he was, he was comparing uh, 10 to 20, 10 to 20,000 reports, uh, per one report that he receives. And of course, that's not just the national UFO reporting. He's, he's talking about MUFON or anybody else. He believes there are multiple, thousands of multiples of unreported sightings. I think, uh, Michael, you got to talk on this one because you've talked to some pretty interesting <clears throat> folk about some of this stuff. Yeah, Michael. Are you talking to, are you talking to me? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, we gotta, I'm going to have to go with Mike then for conflict. There you go. Well, you know, I've, I've seen a couple things, you know, myself. So there's definitely something going on. There's definitely something out there. You know, I, I'm, I, I tend to lean towards it's, it's possibly interdimensional, you know, that they are from Earth, but they've, but they've managed to, to get over into a different dimension, you know, maybe even 5D or, or, or something. And the times that people are seeing them, that they're reported, are times where they're actually maybe relaxed enough, or their 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 brain is is hitting on is hitting on something where they're actually seeing. I think that they're always there. They're, we're just not seeing them unless you're in that unless your brain hits that certain that certain frequency to where you're able to pick up on them with your eyes. Yeah, I. I it's interesting too because I was at. Uh, Big Rock in California. Yeah, it's the same thing I've seen. I, you know, I was told that there's a lot of UFO sightings, and I thought, okay, huh, it's not going to hurt me to go out and check it out. Yeah. And I've personally seen the same things. I've seen multiple objects. Uh, we spent almost probably three and a half hours, and it's ridiculous the amount of things that if you want to go out to an area. It's incredible what you can see in the air, personally. <clears throat> oh, I mean, you know, you guys know that I've got uh, the UFO I team investigation crew, and yeah, we, we hardly ever get skunked when we go out, you know, with our gear, our, uh, our sophisticated uh, cameras and stop action flare photography and everything. I mean, just, there's stuff going on all the time, and it doesn't really seem to matter where we're at although we do go to hot spots you know like east city ranch you know and mount baker and mount adams and certain places like that but it almost seems like you go go in your own backyard uh wait out there for a few hours and see something quite anomalous uh, almost any night of the week if uh, you've got a clear clear enough night sky um we are we're coming up again to the bottom of the hour here for a break but uh, boy this is great stuff I am. Uh, I've got a bunch of questions to uh, ask both of you guys uh, to kind of illuminate this whole subject. Matter of fact, I'm super interested in this engineer's soil, and I got to kind of follow up on some of those questions that I've got in that regard as well. Uh, but um, let's do this. Let's take our break now, and uh, then we'll come back in six minutes and be able to uh, really get down and hunker onto this uh, whole idea of uh, what's going on out there uh, and why things hap seem to be happening so uh, drastically at this current time. So we'll be right back with Spaced Out Sunday after this. Cold, Cold drinks, drinks, great, great food, food, and the, and the best, best music, music in Vancouver. Band. The Moose Vancouver is the place to be, open until 2 a.m. nightly. Everything on the menu starts at just six ninety-five. Who serves food that cheap anymore? At the Moose, you'll never know who you'll run into. Rock stars, actors, athletes, 
It's the place everyone wants to be. So join us at the Moose Vancouver, the Moose Vancouver, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. Hey, space travelers. This is John Rezig, founder of the Chive and Chive Charities. If you know anything about our website, you'd know we like to do things a little differently. We're not some faceless organization collecting money for a nebulous cause. Our donor dollars go directly toward life-improving items. Then we give those items directly to an underdog who needs it most. To become a donor with Spaced Out Radio's official charity, Chive Charities, just go to chivecharities.org forward slash donate. Hello, this is your guitar man, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw, and I have to tell you, I love the response I get for Little Brother is Watching from Spaced Out Radio fans. It's amazing how music can inspire and make people think deeper about what's going on in the supernatural world. You can head over to my website, bumblefoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshops, my touring, even check out some of the hot sauces that I'm working on. And make sure you keep on listening, because with Spaced Out Radio, you know Little Brother is watching. We're adding to the entertainment online for Spaced Out Radio. I'm Amber Beckard, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out Cryptid Tales, where I will take you on a journey into some of the strangest legends and lore from around the world. Relaying the stories to you of the strange creatures and experiences that people have had throughout time. You can find Cryptid Tales at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. And while you're there, don't forget to check out our free archives and leave a comment. See you there. Hey everybody, the SOR Space Travelers is open. For just five bucks a month, you can hang out with Dave and our crew privately in our members only section. With your signing, you'll receive newsletters on what's going on with Spaced Out Radio. You'll have direct contact with the host during the show in our chat, live streaming videos, and a great forum for your posts and more. Become a space traveler now at spacedoutradio.com. Looking for something new to push your limits? Look beyond the spectrum. A new docu-series featuring some of the best researchers in the world when it comes to everything from UFOs, government cover-ups, and strange humanoids. Truth Seekers Stephen Bassett, Jeff Meldrum, Jack Kasher, and Stanton Friedman, among others, all chip in to bring their knowledge to you. Beyond the Spectrum can be found on Amazon as well as Tubi TV. Tell us what you think on our Amazon page. Are you looking for great advertising value for your company? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. We have a multitude of places to get your name out there, including commercial ads during the show, special promotions, and banners on our website. Our audience is proven to support the companies that support our show. We can make your budget work for you. So for more information, please contact us at sales at spacedoutradio.com. At spacedoutradio.com, we are keeping you up to date on all the news with the SOR Newswire. Captain Shirk leads the team that is bringing you the news of the day and exclusive stories on everything paranormal and supernatural. It's free to read, it's updated daily, and it's right there for you. The SOR Newswire is a one-stop shop for the news of the day. Check it out at spacedoutradio.com today. Hello everyone, this is Ryan Stacy from the Experiencer Support Association, otherwise known as TESA. We're glad to team up with Spaced Out Radio to help investigate your experiences on the SOR Sightlines Report. Together, we'll investigate the strange sightings and occurrences you've had. We're looking for answers just like you. So fill out a Sightlines Report on the Spaced Out Radio website and let's figure out what's going on together. Need that weekend supernatural fix? Look no further than Spaced Out Saturday right here at spacedoutradio.com. I'm Stacy Edwards. And I'm John Edwards. Each Saturday night, Stacy and I are going to bring you the best in paranormal, cryptids, UFOs, you name it, and we're going there. It's all about the experience and to share the knowledge with all of you. So tune us in every Saturday night on Spaced Out Saturdays starting at 9.06 p.m. Pacific, 12.06 a.m. Eastern, only at spacedoutradio.com. Hello, space travelers. It's me again, Carl. 
Don't forget to join the Space Travelers Club for just five bucks a month. And follow Spaced Out Radio on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio. Our Instagram, Dave Scott SOR. Our Facebook page is Spaced Out Radio Show. Our archives are free at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Come woo it up with Spaced Out Radio today. Bye. I'm feeling a little spicy tonight. What to do, what to do. Why not get Bumblefoot? Four million Scoville units of pure hard rock. Bumblefoot hot sauces come in three flavors. The burning Bumble. Tone it down a bit with Bumblelicious and throw the sauce on everything. Spicing up. Bumble me, baby. Bumblefoot hot sauce. Get it today at kajans.com. And we are back with Spaced Out Sunday. Welcome back, everyone. And uh, we are here with uh, Mike Kubsinski and uh, Jared Murphy, the paranormal podcasters of Conflict Radio. You know, you guys, before we get any further here, we need to kind of plug uh, your podcast as well and tell people how they can uh, find you guys and what your broadcast schedule usually is. Well, I guess I'll, I'll take that. We You can always find us at www.conflictradio.net. You can find us on all the normal podcast catchers, including Apple iTunes. We normally do a show on Tuesdays and Thursdays, but we're moving it to Mondays and Thursdays here recently. I think that that's the schedule we're going to go with uh, further. You can find us on YouTube. Just search for Conflict Radio or the Conflict Radio Network. We have two channels on there. And if you go to the Conflict Radio Network, you can see on the playlist the shows that Jared and I co-host. It's uh, a different playlist. A lot of shows I'll do by myself, but a lot of them Jared will join me. You know, uh, and uh, we're looking to uh, to do more shows with the two of us. So. Nice, yeah. Well, it's kind of good you guys get uh, that repartee. You know, it's uh, I, I really enjoy having Peter on at least the first part of my show, <laughs> having somebody to talk to to kick things off. You know. <clears throat> well, and I think that if we're gonna, well, yeah, and so I'm at also notaliens.com. You can get a signed copy of my book there, or on Amazon, you can find it there, uh, just for a few dollars less. But I post podcasts like this just to make sure that if people are listening to me, and when. And when conflict, when we're co-hosting on conflict, I'll bring it up. But I always uh, post a link on the main page of my website so that everybody can go find those podcasters and the uh, shows like this that are just doing, you know, you're the one doing all the hard work putting this stuff out there. <laughs> well, it's fun uh, to be able to get together like this periodically uh, and be able to commiserate together and kind of exchange the knowledge that we've, we've got in certain areas. You guys are uh, you know, really out there doing some wonderful work. Um, you know, the, the, the thing that I wanted to follow up on, if I could, uh, with, with both of you and Jared for sure, is this whole idea of engineered soil. I mean, are, are, are you the guy, Jared, that, that basically discovered this? Or tell us a little bit about the history of engineered soil. Yeah, it's so interesting because it's been known about soil scientists have been looking at it for 100 years. There's modern versions of it now called uh, well, it's called biochar and so you mix different uh and what they do is in order to create it it's not like a pot well think of it as a very high-tech potting soil so they're not just mixing in a few minerals they're uh for instance there's different it's not just slash and burn think of it uh like for instance if, if we were going to start an apple orchard you can create a biochar a modern biochar has different elements in it and Sometimes one of those elements is just derived from burning. Obviously, it's biochar. It's exactly what it sounds like. It's a bio uh, carbon that is derived from maybe it's a tree, a particular species. It, it has a particular makeup that makes it easier for a uh, for a you know an apple orchard, or if you were going to do wheat, or if you're going to do corn, 
there's particular mixes that are better, but they've never figured out. When I started working four years ago on my book, the first thing that I found was that it's in this region that's considered a wet desert. That's what Brazil, that's what the Amazon, even with all the tropical lush trees and jungle, it was considered an unsustainable for human civilization because it just didn't have a soil that was rich. And uh, a lot of people may or may not have heard of uh, The Lost City of Z with Brad Pitt. Yeah. And yeah. Right. So he plays Colonel Percy Fawcett, who decides to go back to the Amazon. And the end of the story, I'm not ruining it for anyone. The point is, the big mystery is he disappears into the Amazon jungle. He's never found again. But prior to that, he was an adventurer. He was a cartographer. He actually was the man who had surveyed a lot of Brazil in the Amazon basin for the Queen, for England. And he had found pottery shards and he had positively thought he had found what well, he called it the lost city of Z but as we're finding with LIDAR even in Guatemala there's tens of thousands and possibly millions of constructions that no one's ever noticed before but what was interesting was the soil uh, I started uh, doing all this research and I find a show that aired and they said well before we go look for the last city that Colonel Percy Fawcett was found well, we want to stop at the riverbank here. And we want to show you something. It's really interesting. It's called Terra Preta. It's Portuguese. It's just black soil, black earth. And what's? it's a real mystery because we don't know how to make it. Soil scientists have been looking at it forever. And uh, it's a real mystery because here it is. And, and they're standing in front of a, a section that's been cut open that's about mm, 14 feet deep. And to the best that they can decide, uh, and again, even though there's been surveys, even like Colonel Percy Fawcett going through the Amazon and doing surveys for mapping. It's fascinating that they have guesstimated at, at quite educatedly, mainstream science has determined that the area of the size of basically two Spains is where is how much Terra Preta they think they have found just in Brazil. But they know that this engineered soil exists in Central America. It exists the identical version, I, it's Northern Africa and Australia. And then in Siberia, in Eastern Europe, in Ukraine, throughout Europe, and even in North America, there are different versions of biochars that are ancient, they are old. And it's not a matter of, well, you know, there used to be a forest here and it burned down. No, these are very particular mixes. But the difference is, you know, a lot of people are like, well, why haven't they been able to figure it out? And the, one of the reasons is, is it's a lot like saying, well, how hard is it to reverse engineer Coca-Cola? I don't know if that's the best analogy, but yeah. you know, you get really close and end up with Pepsi or RC. Right. But it's not. Yeah, right? So it's a, there's a reason the Colonel Sanders chicken recipe, is, seasoning recipe is secret. Uh, but that's kind of the same thing. It's that you can only see so much even under an electron microscope and di different uh, techniques that involve these Small, right down to the atom, it's just not been able to be reverse engineered because this soil has a, a lot of weird properties. There's, so I'm not the one who discovered it. There are, I, I, I don't know if tens of thousands, but there are thousands of scientific papers on Terra Preta and on Chernozems. And uh, there are all different, like you can go uh, internet search soil maps. On, I mean, if you really want to bore yourself a little bit. And I thought, well, how can I write a book that'll maybe go make all alternative history be more topsy-turvy, kind of go at the uh, the church standard academia and ufologists. How do I go at this? Okay, let's say that it's uh, an ancient human race. It appears we've missed uh, like a whole giant chapter with engineered soil, and it appears that we don't have our genetic history down. And Well, let's just try to get at everybody in my book. Okay, so here we are. And I think that the soil, once you look at it, and again, having a construction, I work with structural engineers, I've done really complex remodeling. And so it didn't take me long to look at the evidence of engineered soil on continents where it should not exist in time periods where the last thing people were supposed to be looking at was whether or not the soil was good growing beyond where you randomly found it. And here is like something we take for granted is crop rotation. One of the first people who developed that was right here in Minnesota at the uh, 
the Kelly Farm. It's something that we kids go to in Minnesota. It's up north, and well, it's not far from the Twin Cities. It's about forty minutes, but it's a working experimental University of Minnesota, well, in association with them, farm that is also a historical farm that. Uh, after the Civil War, uh, Kelly actually went down to the South, helped process. Uh, everything about crop rotation as we know it is not a common thing. Uh, there's so many technologies around farming that we take for granted was, well, everybody knew how to do that tens of thousands of years ago. Well, they certainly, from what we can tell, whether it's a nomadic culture or a settled society, they were not creating super complex, basically self-sustaining biochars that were good almost indefinitely and are literally, no joke, there's a black market for black soil. I'll they, bet. They, and there's actually a black market for it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, um, that is fascinating. Um, the idea that there is this soil that uh, is special out there. Let me ask you this. Is there any way to determine uh, whether this engineered soil uh, predates uh, hominids, uh, you know, appearing on the planet? Or did it show up at one point when, for instance, we just started farming? You know, is there a time frame that they've been able to determine this soil arriving on the planet? Well, so the... Uh, the so here's the thing it's one of those so yes there's been a test of of what's been tested it's some of it's showing specifically on the i like to rely on scientific papers i like to actually make sure that there's field research and there's a vast amount on this subject and there are two parts to it so one i can tell you that one of the papers i looked at and it wasn't random it was definitely uh, uh well researched and peer-reviewed, but we're looking at 7,069 to 7,000 years old. But I read many papers, and this is what's interesting, is that the compounds and complexities of this soil is something that everyone's fascinated in reproducing. But one of the things that it's a giant elephant in the room, and this is what's fascinating, and it, I think it's been ignored primarily because it's just not that interesting to most people who are trying to find the next King Tut or some dynastic grave or something that's, you know, that's interesting. You know, the golden monkey and, you know, raiders is fun, not, not engineered soil. And I have commonly seen in these papers where they don't want to touch the age of it. Ah. They, and, and they <clears throat> won't. And yet it's found like the depth of it just in the Amazon area where Colonel Percy Fawcett, the fact that they have established that there's at least an area twice the size of Spain just in that Amazon area. And it's easily, it, it can be as little as, it, it's over three meters. So we're talking, you know, it, it, it can be 12 to 20 feet thick. And it's not a matter of them just repeating and composting this is the actual engineered soil and again it's on a time frame if we look at who is in africa six thousand years ago and who's in australia and particularly australia which is supposed to be indigenous aboriginals that had no contact with anybody yet there's a lot of evidence that has been thrown out there for a lot of years that says that, that isn't the case based on you know there's a there's a strong possibility the Egyptians were there but that's a whole other rabbit hole but for now here's this area in the lower middle section of Australia and you have these areas on three continents showing the identical soil at, at least in a time period that it should not exist period there should be no travel between these continents according to mainstream academia and gosh we could spend a lot of irrelevant time when we could ask good questions right now as to, wow, well, you know, they, they don't want to admit or deal with the fact. I mean, we could deconstruct. Uh, we have Sumeria. We possibly have uh, in 2000. Well, there are pyramids or are structures in Mexico and what we're finding in Guatemala. It's pretty clear that we do not remotely have an idea of what's going on in South America in pre what we're going to call the, you know, we have the Incas and Mayas. We have the Olmecs. We have Toltecs. We have a number of other indigenous uh, tribal-like peoples. And we have this history that says, well, somewhere around the land bridge theory is that 
we and again the younger dry is 12,600 ish years ago that well there was the land bridge and a few thousand or hundred people made their way through North America and got really busy building and based on the lidar scans in Guatemala you know we're talking the estimates now were that at least 15 to 20 million lived in this area and that's just Central America that's just Guatemala and that's just in the course of them determining a 500 well 800 square mile lidar scan of a 5,000 square mile project which then again you back it up and go okay well that doesn't determine why we have engineered soil on multiple continents and i'm specifically talking about right now one brand so between australia south america central america and northern africa we have an identical brand like let's just call it coca-cola okay and it's and then in siberia to north america we have a completely different engineered soil but it's still engineered but we only have histories of indigenous land bridge people so what i found again in this research is well this soil has these electromagnetic properties it seems to be able to sustain a current it can filter heavy metals it can filter carbon dioxide it has this high mineral content we can't seem to get uh the nutrient rich density that this soil see keeps holding we can't pro we can't do that and then the hot potato in the room is well you ch you destroy every uh standard academic model of human history you don't even need to get, dig up gobekli tepe now which we do but you can now look at soil science from the standpoint of saying okay well it appears more than nomadic peoples lived in many many areas where whether their constructions were wood or metal or uh even stone that was repurposed into other buildings we have now another element, including the foundational structures themselves, that the very machines that move these incredible giant cymatic blocks and constructions, and however complex they were, that possibly the level and density of the compaction and the composition of the soil itself under these foundational structures and the surrounding soil based on what's called seismic metamaterials. So this is about building skyscrapers and cities and buildings that won't fall down during earthquakes. And it involves sifting the soil, the soil composition, uh, artificial nanostructures that would be wave resonators, which help either mute or amplify waves and frequencies under structures. We don't know because it's not something we were looking at. Uh, I think a lot of people, if we were to back up, a lot of people might not know that archaeology was not founded on figuring out the human, like what's our history. That wasn't the point. Uh, the father of South American archaeology, I, I have it in my book, it, his whole thing was to acknowledge that art history was the history. It was what would look good on my Victorian fire mantle. You know, it was <laughs> this little, you know, it was this little Greek statue, you know, and, and I found one so i want another one huzzah yeah yeah you know you know jared i think you just answered a question that's been burning in my mind but i want to double back and ask it anyway um these different in, uh engineered soils on different continents around the planet um i think you said that some of them are similar uh, from different continents and some of them then are are not similar but are still uh, engineered because my question was could it have been for instance a remnant or an artifact of the worldwide flood this engineered soil you know the the level of you know uh, feet or inches or you know um, yards of it uh, being all over the planet I've heard that layer you know, that they kind of attribute to the flood uh, as well. Is that anything near what we're talking about on the engineered uh, soil? Well, what's interesting is that it's not... Um, I, so there are areas where we know that the flood happened, and we have a lot of different flood myth mythos, and that the theory is that, well... Somewhere around 12,600 years ago, the ice sheets had large lakes, maybe. That's one idea that 
or that there was a solar incident, there was a meteor, there's a, a basically that these ice areas melted quickly and they flooded and they raised up the water level and then of course you have sediment. I was in South Africa doing research in all of January and there's a large area of South Africa where I was is where a lot of the stone circles are and a lot of an undeclared race of uh, society of basically an untaught civilization lived over thousands of square kilometers and I was literally viewing their ruins and many of them were built on top of a 15 to 20 to 30 foot layer of sediment and this is at a sea level of 5,000 feet where on average we were about 47 to 5,000 feet above sea level and this is an area that was definitely completely a layer up to you know 20 feet or in some places more was all that sandy silk definitely it was flooded whatever was there when it comes to topsoil had been displaced and the issue is well what are we going to do about saying north africa is a desert how are we going to identify that soil there well there's some remnants of it left and we know some of the ages on it but the question then is is what is the oldest and lowest layer of these soils it has not been a primary focus of uh, any of us to do any of the research, like even in South America where Colonel Percy Fawcett was lost, to say, okay, well, how much of the entire world was covered in silt? Uh, uh, you know, like a silica sand, you know, your, take, take your sandy beach. How much of our world was actually covered and how much of it was displaced? Like part of your question is, well, could the soil have been in one location and then kind of flipped like a, like a, a broken pancake or an omelet could it have just folded on itself maybe for instance there's a lot of different uh aspects of how this could have happened and for instance easter island a lot of people like to talk about the buried easter island heads that they're not heads that they're full body they're 40 to 60 feet tall well what's true about the burying of the heads one of the theories was that be part of this flood came on the Easter Island and the island flooded. So the heads were buried. Well, the whole body figures were buried because they were flooded. Well, Dr. Robert Schock, who a lot of you, I'm sure you're familiar with and probably have interviewed, but Dr. Robert Schock's theory on Easter Island is that one, not all the heads were buried, but the ones that were are near a volcano on the island. And in this geological instance, his opinion is that they're so ancient that based on what was found around them, and mind you, there's only been two scientific digs, and they're managed by a, a gal that runs the Easter Island Project out of Berkeley, California. And I mentioned them in my book, and they did two scientific studies of two Easter Island full excavations down to the base, and then they coated them and reburied them. So there hasn't been a lot of soil sampling. But from what Robert Schock's opinion was, is that the volcano itself, the side of the erosion after so much time, there was so much erosion that the silk that that the silt that was covering these Easter Island, these 150 heads that are now heads that used to be full bodied statues. The reason they buried wasn't the flood. It had just sloughed off the volcano. And this is an island that's important because it has polygonal masonry. It also has the most sacred thing on the island is a stone sphere, just like the ones in Costa Rica, the ones that are found in Bosnia, and the ones that are found in China. They were found, they were found in San Francisco. Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, David Hatcher Childress loves to talk about stone spheres. And those stone spheres also have waves, wave resonator properties. So one of the things that everyone's always been trying to find out is, well, now it ties into the soil. You have piezoelectric growing uh, in a soil with a group of people that are building these cymatic polygonal constructions that are found from Easter Island, now paint the picture, all the way through Egypt, all the way to Angkor Wat, all the way through the east and the west. And now if we can pinpoint the location of these engineered soils, whether it's North America and we don't have a civilization to account for it, instead of going, well, we, we just know this black soil is, uh, well, we know it's dino dust. We just know that it's, uh, well, you know, there's a lot of soil here and it just kind of stayed in place and it didn't get flooded, what have you, right? But we have lots of locations of soil. We have layers of sediment 
and we have areas that have not been flooded. So the question is, was the whole planet, I, I, I'm glad you brought it up because I've been thinking a little more about this. Why is it that the flood stories, including a review recently of the Anunnaki and the stories that, again, the Sumerian tablets that we translate, one of the stories is that, hey, there's a flood coming and we have to prepare for it. And again, of course, it gets translated. The, there's the biblical story of, no, hey, there's a flood coming. It does kind of appear that maybe it wasn't all at once. Maybe there wasn't a uh, simultaneous flooding of everywhere. There's a good possibility that areas flooded and subsided and areas of the Pacific, the Atlantic, the the area at the Indian Ocean, basically, in that area between Australia, there's a good chance that all of this flooded, not simultaneously, but as different ice sheets flooded, it, it kind of filled one area, and then it kind of lava lamped it as far as the ground coverage, because Ooh, we I, know that North... I like that. Yeah. I like the term lava lamped. That, that, that does fit the scenario. <laughs> and we're at the top of the hour again, you guys. This is getting hotter and hotter. I love it. We're going to take six minutes and break with uh, with uh, you guys, and we're going to come right back with uh, with Mike and Jared and the Paranormal Podcasters after this. Hey, hey space, space travelers. travelers. This, this is, is John, John Resig, founder of the Chide and Chide Charity. If you know anything about our website, you know we like to do things a little differently. We're not some faceless organization collecting money for a nebulous cause. Our donor dollars go directly toward life-improving items. Then we give those items directly to an underdog who needs it most. To become a donor with Spaced Out Radio's official charity, Chive Charities, just go to chivecharities.org forward slash donate. Are you an experiencer of something strange that can't be explained? Do you want help finding out what's going on? I'm Ryan Stacy, head of the Experiencer Support Association, otherwise known as TESSA. We've teamed up with Spaced Out Radio to investigate cases filled out in the SOR Sightlines report. We are independent, and there's no cost to what we do. All we need is your experience. Let's find out what's happening together on the SOR Sightlines report. We are scouring the world for the most intriguing stories of your day. Take the time to read up on the SOR Newswire, where our team, led by Captain Shirk, will deliver to you some of the best paranormal and supernatural news, along with some stories that will blow your mind from the weird to the wacky. It's the news outside the news that piques interest, and that's what we're looking to deliver to you. The SOR Newswire, only at spacedoutradio.com. Hi there, this is Dave Scott, and I'm bringing you the woo every Monday through Friday on Spaced Out Radio. I'm going all out to bring you the strangest, oddest stories and subjects I could find for your entertainment. Why? Because when we hit peak woo, I know I've done my job. So come tune us in at spacedoutradio.com, 906 Pacific, 1206 AM Eastern, and together, my friends, we own the night. The SOR Vault is open for business, and do we have some cool swag for you to pick up. All you have to do is head over to our website and click on the SOR Vault. You have a variety of cool logos to choose from, and put them on anything you want. T-shirts, hoodies, hats, coffee mugs, you name it, we can get it to you. So do your shopping by supporting the story you love. Get your Spaced Out Radio swag at the SOR Vault today. If you like it hot, real hot, then heat up your meals with Bumblefoot Hot Sauce. Get your Bumblefoot Hot Sauce today. The sauce, Bumblelicious, and the 4 million Scoville unit, Bumble f We're going in hot, real hot, coming out even hotter. Keep the milk nearby. And tantalize your taste buds tonight. Bumblefoot Hot Sauce, available now at kajans.com. Hello, space travelers. It's me again, Carl. Don't forget to join the Space Travelers Club for just five bucks a month. And follow Spaced Out Radio on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio. Our Instagram, Dave Scott SOR. Our Facebook page is Spaced Out Radio Show. Our archives are free at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Come woo it up with Spaced Out Radio today. Bye.
We all know on Spaced Out Radio we love a good beard and mustache. So why not take care of your facial hair with Mighty Moose Beard Oil? Made in Canada, we're taking care of beards and stashes around the world. We use 100% natural ingredients with our oils and balms to make your whiskers feel silky smooth. Use promo code SOR2019 at MightyMooseBeard.com today. Looking for creative ways to get your company out in the public? How about advertising on Spaced Out Radio? Our sales department is waiting to hear from you, and we can work around any budget. From commercial spots to banners to special promotions, there are many opportunities to get your name and product out to our SOR listeners. For a price guide and more information, please contact us at sales at spacedoutradio.com. Get your horns up with me on Spaced Out Radio. This is Ron Bumblefoot Thaw. Come tune in to SOR where you can hear me rock out with Little Brother is Watching, the official theme song of Spaced Out Radio. And then come on over to Bumblefoot.com where you can find out about my tour schedule, my music, and everything else. Bumblefoot.com keeps you up to date on what I'm doing and the best way to stay in touch with my music and music camps. Sign up for my newsletter at Bumblefoot.com and remember, Little Brother is Watching. Hi. This is Amber Beckrude, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel where we store all of the SOR show archives for free. And as an added bonus, every two weeks, I'm posting brand new content on Cryptid Tales, where I will get into some of the spookier legends and folklore from around the world and tell the stories that go with them. Find us at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio and check out Cryptid Tales today. Drop a comment and let me know what you want to hear. See you there. For the price of one cup of coffee a month, you can become an SOR Space Traveler. The Space Travelers Club is a place where you can interact with other listeners, either live during the show or on our great forum. We want your stories, pictures, comments, and ideas. You'll get live video streams, exclusive content, and be a part of our newsletter. Stay in touch with everything SOR. The Space Travelers Club is just 5 bucks a month at spacedoutradio.com. Hey everyone, I'm John Edwards. And I'm Stacy Edwards. Together we're taking over Saturday nights on Spaced Out Radio where we're going to bring our own experiences of the paranormal and talk to the best people we can find to help bring you answers to your strange tales. We're here to entertain your need for weekend. Woo! So tune us in at spacedoutradio.com starting at 9.06 Pacific, 12.06 AM Eastern where we can all get a little spooky together. Spaced Out Saturday nights right here at spacedoutradio.com. Well, welcome back to the third and final hour of Spaced Out Sunday. I am your host, Michael W. Hall. Thanks for being with us. We welcome, welcome back, back everyone listening in. Our, our terrestrial affiliates, WQEE 99.1 and FM in Newton, Georgia, and UPRN 107.7 FM in New Orleans. On the digital side, we are also on Revolution Radio. And don't forget, you can always check out our archives for free at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do us that favor and hit the subscribe button there. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to some Bumblefoot, shopping at Captain Shirk's Spaced Out Radio Store, and uh, the catching up with the SOR Newswire and so much more. So... We are back with uh, Mike Kopsinski and Jared M- Murphy, and we are talking about um, interesting uh, idea of the planet uh, maybe being older, of course, than we thought, and then the, uh, the races on the planet having technology, or at least somebody having technology on the planet that is way outstripping what we can even do today. Uh, welcome back, you guys. <clears throat> It's good to be here. Yeah. Um, so, so Michael, uh, we've given you a break here so far on a lot of this stuff. <laughs> I know you're probably just chomping at the I bit. Have to... a, I have a question for Jared, if that's okay. Yeah, that'd be great. Go for it. I wanted, I want to talk <clears throat> about frequency and the effect it has on our consciousness, and I, I, I want to ask Jared about the possibility that the engineered soil 
if it's so good at at resonating frequency if if perhaps the engineered soil is perhaps creating a frequency that's maybe putting our brains into safe mode that's a i think that's a great possibility I mean, it's a great question and it's the possibility i think we've discussed this it's not just the soil it's the fact that none of the buildings the like our consciousness needs to fully reactivate a couple things i think there's a more than enough mainstream data about there being a collective human consciousness you can call it whatever you want but i think this ties into that we have enough people on the planet again for that extra memory that extra ram that why you know like why is it that leonardo da vinci he was a great inventor he was brilliant but they only came up with stuff that was wood or you know materials he could think of but there was only so many people on the planet i think there was only so far you could stretch your mindset out of where you're at but here we are with so many people on the planet and the ideas and the inventions right down to 3d printers now don't seem lineal and i think in the past that consciousness that awareness was because you're literally walking on soil that if you had full value of all your genetic senses which we're thinking that uh, when you say paranormal or when you say uh, extraterrestrial or when you say um interdimensional whatever you know pick a buzzword or pick a theoretical idea of what's the uh well you know we think they're unrelated you know ghost stories or uh these other experiences and i think that this consciousness aspect of these frequencies and waves and i think when we had the earth tuned it was part of the terraforming itself so it wasn't just that they were managing earthquakes for constructions and setting you know as far as like what we would do through a telephone wire they may have been using the soil itself not just like we have the nazca lines and you know the <laughs> one of the alternative theories is that well you know we have the nazca lines because well they, they were pointing to water that's one theory because a lot of people like to think of the animals at, at the nazca lines in peru this is also where the paracas were found and mind you the paracas uh one of the reasons when i started looking at research was that the Paracas are 9,000 years old. Some of the mummies are 9,000 years old in that region because so dry, they're just preserved. So that's interesting. But here we are with this soil and the Nazca lines where, again, they also show signs of arsenic. Uh, they are 25 kilometers. There's one that's at least 25 kilometers long. It doesn't bend left or right. Why? It looks like an earth circuit. When you look at Bolivia, they have, there are lines in Bolivia, there are lines in Jordan, there's lines all over the earth that are similar to the nazca lines and they look like earth circuits but the prob the the properties to test the consciousness aspect partly is i think right now we're rediscovering some of our abilities and i've mentioned this before with like synesthesia and wim hof like the idea of consciously controlling your immune system i think the reason we even have these ideas and the reason we've jumped not just from cell phones it's not just progressional it's because we have on one level this human ram but on the physical level the soil connected to uh, fungus and bacteria we now know that some of the largest creatures we thought it was pando uh, was a large tree network of a single tree that's over fifty thousand trees but we now know that there's some fungal and or bacterial networks that are larger living entities than even pando and so if you had the ability to connect all the buildings uh trees the soil not just for a protective mode for your metropolis on it or in it but also the ability to send and receive for a human population i think your consciousness <laughs> would be much more activated we we already know from studies that if you study uh like just say you're going to memorize pick the most boring document your insurance information <laughs> and you're going to memorize this sitting in nature they have found that your memory is better no matter what you're thinking about it's 33 percent better retained when you sit in a natural environment when you go to learn something if you and then they repeated the study in a boring room where you choose to, where they would 
you know, instead of just studying either in a city or a natural environment, humans heighten memory. It seems like we are genetically built. And the first assumption is, well, yeah, because we were all in a loincloth and we were all hunting deer and things. And obviously we are more connected to nature because that's our, our movement complexity. That's where we were. Well, no, what if, again, the soil, the people, the, that collective consciousness, the buildings and the engineering themselves, it wasn't very hard with a pineal gland that we're connecting all of it together and where you have what the missing elements right now is that we are disconnected from the soil. We frequently aren't in nature. And when they, uh, to continue this test idea, what I was telling you is that they sat people down in just a, a boring room, but they gave them pictures of cities and they gave them pictures of natural environments and retested the memorization process and found that people, again, still remember things better in a natural environment. But I, what I'm trying to stress is, is that what we are misidentifying as natural is old technology, right down to fungal and bacterial networks. And it br was brought to my attention by Michael Cremo that you have approximately 5,000 species a year being discovered in the last 40 years. So not just fish and toads and frogs and birds and things we thought were dead, we are discovering viruses and bacteria and other creatures. We've just discovered one of our first uh, creatures on the planet that does not breathe oxygen. We now know that there are creatures that do not live, eat, breathe, and die on oxygen. And the question is, what do we have that indicates that this is, in quotes, a natural environment and not a disjointed, broken, high-technology, terraformed environment I, you oh know, i've joked about this before but that's I'll say it now that's fascinating yeah um i i've got a follow-up on that but go ahead and hit your point first oh no no, no. It's a, let's go let's go into the next thing well i i just had an observation uh because i remember uh this kind of ties into what you're saying about the natural uh connection you know that uh, indigenous people might have had over us uh, there was a study done by the U.S. Army, and this this wasn't back in the uh, Civil War times. This was uh, World War II times where they literally had, you know, the code talkers from the Navajo were used uh, for code breaking and, and code keeping, of course, uh, during the Second World War. But they also had uh, Native American trackers who were very good uh, in, in Vietnam and in, you know, uh, different areas of, of the planet being able to track, literally, uh, you know, troop movements and those kinds of things. They had this ability, uh, native ability, to uh, really be good trackers. And um, they found out that uh, when these new recruits from the Navajos or whatever the Hopi uh, guys that were coming in to being recruited to do this, uh, they would te they would test them and you know take the best ones that were really good trackers, <clears throat> then they would in induct them into the, the the armed service and they would first thing they do right is they cut their hair, uh, literally give them the buzz cut like everybody else and they found out this was an actual army study that their ability to track, to actually be able to do their native. Uh, you know, abilities was um, was curtailed when their hair was cut. Isn't that weird? Yeah. And and now you're talking, of course, you're talking uh, back in those days, uh, many of those folks were, were walking barefoot and or in moxican, mox, moccasin as well and and able to uh, have more connection with the uh, the soil itself. Yeah, I think we take it for granted that it's a, oh, it's a myst we mystify it, we deify it, and there's nothing wrong with having a personal belief system, but I think there's an actual technology involved. And also with, uh, again, human consciousness or creature, there's all these legends and stories of, you know, talking to animals, even in the Bible, in the beginning, we all talk to animals. And then, you know, the flood happens. And I actually point this out in my book that, we have this God, God basically going from, you know, the let the let the baby lay on the cobra's nest, and, you know, pick your version. But then after the flood, it's a free for all. Just eat everybody. And this connection for natives. Yeah. 
and the hair, I find it very fascinating that this, we have, I, I go on a lot about genetic memory and the possibility of that, but this is a great example of, uh, I feel like this technology, because we're so dormant and only 10 to 14% conscious, and we only know so much about the human brain right now, that it's a lot like, uh, a, you know, we forgot that it was a 747. I use that example where, you know, you're banging on the control panel and it's lighting up. And every time you bang on it, it you get the same response. So you assume that that's the scientific process. Like you, in order for you to get, it's not flip the switch, it's bang on the control panel and you get a response. So just walking on the earth on soil that was absolutely designed possibly to connect with you and fungus and through a neural network in the ground and then translate information either through an animal, which allegedly we used to be able to speak with, in a way, maybe that's what it was, where we have these disjointed ideas that have been, again, either deified or mystified, that what if we were talking and connecting and communicating as, because what are we doing? We're ultimately traveling through the currents of space, right? So there is waves through space that our solar system, that our galaxy, that this end of the universe is, we're, we're moving through things that are essentially electromagnetic and are, and we have so many things in the atmosphere right up to our ionosphere that are filtering these things out. But what if there's a point where they could, despite all the high technology, the engineered soil, everything kind of working well together, right down to the elements, what if they could filter it out and then you become angry or I become frustrated or you couldn't, you know, you could track something as simple as that, but well, where are we in space and what are we traveling? So again, it kind of pushes out the idea of, well, we have to control that. You would have to have satellites. You'd have to look outside of the planetary system and maybe begin to predict what is the planet about to, what kind of current of space is the planet going to travel through? And then, is that frequency, that wave, that magnetic field, is it going to hit us badly? Just like there are cycles around the moon and people talk, you know, we, we would not have waves. You know, there's a lot of weird things about that. But I think this Indian point and what you just pointed out is stellar. I have not heard that before. But I think it ties exactly into a remnant, dormant, unconscious genetic ability. And for whatever reason, their ability to retain this functionality is happening yet there is this physical this point where if their hair's cut and you gotta wonder if part of it is just a mutation of how it's been forgotten about or rediscovered or as it digressed from a conscious choice into a, a habit what's the stored genetic memory behind it it does it indicate that it was this connection with the ground with the soil that help them see, like not just track. We have to, I'm saying that in the past, so we have two exciting points. One is uh, now in muted safe mode, they're able to track and follow. I'm saying it in the highest engineered past and not back in the past where we likely also had native peoples who mimicked what they saw and lived alongside maybe peaceably, like we have 150 tribes today doing it all over the world. But what if in the past, high technology wise, you could step out on the soil or stay in a building that's cymatically connected to that ground and to that soil and all the way to where your friends are. Instead of you picking up a cell phone, you're communicating with each other or you're present through abilities like synesthesia, that you're actually present with people in locations that you don't either have to travel to or get on an external piece of technology. The, the, this could be an echoing remnant of that, which is why this is such a huge topic. And without your show and conflict radio, seriously, this is not a plug. I think that this is a point where we need to recognize this is all, this is what's exciting. No matter how you're listening to this or we're talking about it, these are all abilities that we have and each of us have to be a self-experimenter and each of us have to be a part of rediscovering our lost history. Yeah. Oh, and, and that brings up the whole issue that uh, I've also heard as well is that they're discovering, I believe, that our our DNA, the, the very uh, engine of our, our molecules in our body, uh, is not necessarily just um, a... Um, 
oh, you know, something that's that's got like a, a blueprint in it. It is more of a antenna, from what I gather. The DNA molecules literally are receiving information from our environment around us. Uh, and of course, that brings up the whole issue of, uh, the, you know, the Schumann resonance of the entire planet and, and, and Nikola Tesla. You know, what the heck did he know about all of that? You know, the wireless energy out there. I, I bet you've uh, run across some interesting phenomena when you, when you talk about Tesla as well. Yeah, and this, this, this whole, these remnant technologies, these things that, again, if we just lift uh, any paradigms we have just from these working theories of, if we stop just, well, let's just try to deprove the existing status quo theories. Of, well, let's, let's have a new template, but it still addresses everything from the same angle, that the technology is foreign, the technology is external, the technology is not from the planet, and that's just a wrong direction, I think. I don't know, what do you think, Mike? Well, I, I have a I have a question. I have a question about engineered soil. If, if human beings were engineered, let's just say by an alien species, and our consciousness was basically at one point one hundred percent say we used 100% of our brain at one point because not only did they engineer humans, they also engineered our soil. The flood happening and displacing so much of the soil spread it out in a, in a way to where our consciousness is no longer at 100% because the soil is only in, in certain areas of the world now where it was supposed to be everywhere that we walked. Yeah, patchy and like it got disjointed. Yeah, you know what I mean. And and that itself it messed with the frequency the frequency of the Earth, therefore messing with our experience of consciousness itself. Damn it! I wish I would have thought of that seriously. <laughs> Way to go, Mike. <laughs> uh, well, so I think that it goes back to what would normally be. Hey, well, we've been, I mean, well, it's ridiculous. There's so many sites. What I was about to linger on was the idea that, well, there's Tiwanaku and Sacsayhuaman and Oyate Tambo and these mysterious sites that Kikane pointed out. And a, a large number of the megalithic structures, some of it are deeply uh, in, they're embedded in a mud that's clear that a flood took out a lot of these structures. But we do know, for instance, like Doggerland in England, you know, from Doggerland is the area from Scotland and, you know, Ireland all the way to France. It was one giant area. And even 6,000 years ago, you could basically walk from France to England. And Doggerland going back 16,000 years was even more complex. So one, we have marine, you know, obviously underwater, we lose all sorts of information. And so there's a significant, there's millions of square miles that were above ground, above water, and could have been the population centers. I mean, we have to really, we keep looking at our continental maps and saying, and I do have a revised map that shows 50,000 years past, but in my book, but here we're talking about, well, a snapshot of the earth. Everyone has the map in their head, but imagine more so if you were looking at the map with just Ohio and Nevada being the coastlines and tell me what you could tell me about American history. Yeah. And yeah. So the soil, like why do the, like the Gobi desert, well, the, the, all the different, just pick every desert around the planet and explain to me, well, that's due to jet streams and there's nothing, you know, it's a dry area, but we know North Africa, even 6,000 years ago, while well, Doggerland is above water, we know that all of North Africa now, based on what they're finding, was a lush tropical environment. They thought maybe it was only at the end of the last ice age. You know, the initial comeback on the Sphinx was that it was the the deluge that they were thinking that the Sphinx would have been under was about 36. Remember the first reports about that, Michael? That the uh, I remember watching this fascinated in the early 90s that when they finally started admitting that the Sphinx was possibly ancient, I remember watching a show where they're like, well, the last deluges would have been 36,000 years ago. And, okay, but it was uh, a giant tropical environment. But again, here's the assumption. Well, it's native. It's uh, not native. Sorry. It's uh, 
uh, virgin. So as we've deforested the rainforest, we have found for the last 30 years, giant earthworks and megalithic structures. And now with LIDAR, we're seeing that there's nothing virgin about the rainforest. It appears that it has been heavily occupied by either megalithic societies, like more advanced or simpler people. So one, where's all the engineered soil that's underwater? Two, what about all these desert locations that were clearly containing other societies that, well, those areas were they weaponized and wiped out or are those, well, you know, the jet stream changed and, and well, voila, we have a desert and then it goes right back to not being desert. Well, what about that soil? And then if the floods came and then erased even further, if we're talking about a society like the Cuba, like the city that's off the coast of Cuba, that's 2,300, well, it's 1,700 meters, it's about 23, 2,400 meters deep. And it could have only been above water. And this is a city that is, un it's there. And it, it, there's pictures of it and it, had to have been above water at least 50,000 years ago. Wow. So what do we do now with all this soil that is still in places? But now look at it this way. It's not just, think of Terra Preta as one soil. And I mentioned another one like Chernozems. There's different kinds of biocharred soils that may have been engineered for growing and filtering carbon dioxide. But we're making an assumption that there aren't other combos of soils. Like I said, the very foundations of the structures we've been staring at and so busy looking for mummies and so busy looking for jewelry and tablets, not anyone that I know of has actually done a core sample to say how deep, what is the compaction rate of why Sakse Waman or pick your giant megalithic structure is still level. Yeah. Even if you could, right? Good point. And we're at the bottom of the hour already. we got to take another break. Holy mackerel, we've got a, one more segment left with, uh, oh my gosh, Mike Kopsinski and, and Jared uh, Murphy. We, we are just hitting this thing out of the park tonight on the whole idea of the planet being not quite what we understand it is. So we'll be right back after this. Look no further than Spaced Out Saturday, Saturday, right here at SpacedOutRadio.com. I'm Stacey Edwards. And I'm John Edwards. Each Saturday night, Stacey and I are going to bring you the best in paranormal, cryptids, UFOs, you name it, and we're going there. It's all about the experience and to share the knowledge with all of you. So tune us in every Saturday night on Spaced Out Saturdays, starting at 9.06 p.m. Pacific, 12.06 a.m. Eastern, only at SpacedOutRadio.com. I'm feeling a little spicy tonight. What to do? What to do? Why not get Bumblefoot? Four million Scoville units of pure hard rock. Bumblefoot hot sauces come in three flavors. The burning bumble. Tone it down a bit with Bumblelicious and throw the sauce on everything. Spice it up. Bumble me, baby. Bumblefoot hot sauce. Get it today at kajans.com. Are you looking for great advertising value for your company? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. We have a multitude of places to get your name out there, including commercial ads during the show, special promotions, and banners on our website. Our audience is proven to support the companies that support our show. We can make your budget work for you. So for more information, please contact us at sales at spacedoutradio.com. Hey everybody, the SOR Space Travelers is open. For just five bucks a month, you can hang out with Dave and our crew privately in our members only section. With your signing, you'll receive newsletters on what's going on with Spaced Out Radio. You'll have direct contact with the host during the show in our chat, live streaming videos, and a great forum for your posts and more. Become a space traveler now at spacedoutradio.com. You wanted new SOR gear, and now you can have it. The SOR Vault is fully stocked with t-shirts, hats, hoodies, mugs, and everything in between with great logos for you to choose from. So head on over to spacedoutradio.com, click on the SOR Vault, and go shopping. Pricing is quite affordable, and you can look good representing your favorite show. So go to our website and pick up your new SOR wear at the SOR Vault today. 
Are you addicted to the woo? Good. Me too. This is Dave Scott, and you can woo it up with me every Monday through Friday, starting at 9.06 Pacific, 12.06 a.m. Eastern, for three hours of great entertainment in the subjects you love. UFOs, ghosts, cryptids, intuition, yes, we hit it all five days a week. Look for us at spacedoutradio.com, where together, my friends, we own the night. At spacedoutradio.com, we are keeping you up to date on all the news with the SOR Newswire. Captain Shirk leads the team that is bringing you the news of the day and exclusive stories on everything paranormal and supernatural. It's free to read, it's updated daily, and it's right there for you. The SOR Newswire is a one-stop shop for the news of the day. Check it out at spacedoutradio.com today. Hello, everyone. This is Ryan Stacy from the Experiencer Support Association, otherwise known as TESA. We're glad to team up with Spaced Out Radio to help investigate your experiences on the SOR Sightlines Report. Together, we'll investigate the strange sightings and occurrences you've had. We're looking for answers just like you. So fill out a Sightlines Report on the Spaced Out Radio website, and let's figure out what's going on together. Hey, Spaced Out Radio fans, it's John Rezig, founder of the Chive and Chive Charities. Our goal is to make the life of veterans, first responders, and those with rare medical conditions 10% happier. We do this by donating one grant item, ranging from dance to therapy programs to prosthetic limbs, to those who need it most. To contribute to Spaced Out Radio's official charity, head over to chivecharities.org and become a donor today. Hello, this is your guitar man, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw, and I have to tell you, I love the response I get for Little Brother is Watching from Spaced Out Radio fans. It's amazing how music can inspire and make people think deeper about what's going on in the supernatural world. You can head over to my website, bumblefoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshops, my touring, even check out some of the hot sauces that I'm working on. And make sure you keep on listening, because with Spaced Out Radio, you know Little Brother is Watching. From the heartlands of Canada to beards around the world, we know how to take care of you. Fill your follicles with the Mighty Moose Beard Oil. All our oils and balms are handmade and 100% natural ingredients because we care about your beard. And hey, use the promo code SOR2019 and get your Mighty Moose Beard Oil today. You can check us out on our website, MightyMooseBeard.com. We're adding to the entertainment online for Spaced Out Radio. I'm Amber Beckrude, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out Cryptid Tales, where I will take you on a journey into some of the strangest legends and lore from around the world, relaying the stories to you of the strange creatures and experiences that people have had throughout time. You can find Cryptid Tales at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. And while you're there, don't forget to check out our free archives and leave a comment. See you there. And we are back with uh, Mike Kopsinski and Jared uh, Murphy, and we are talking about connectivity of the entire planet, basically. Uh, the whole idea that uh, seems to me that uh, we might have uh, lost some technology or maybe not taken advantage of some technology that was uh, ancient that uh, is all around us on the planet. You, you know, you guys, I don't know if you've, uh, well, you, you, you wouldn't know this, but I've got something uh, to share as well when it comes to uh, connectivity and the whole idea of the Schumann resonance, you know, of the, of the planet, you know, actually kind of vibrating in one giant uh, frequency. Um, the UFOI team that I uh, founded and, and uh, direct uh, we go out sky watching and we have all this sophisticated gear that we've been, you know, doing, uh, you know, videotaping of uh, UAP and and UFOs for years. 
just recently we're finding out that it looks as if the UFOs that used to, we, we thought, used to travel in a straight line. You know, typically we would uh, videotape them and they'd be streaking in and out, you know, and sometimes they'll, they'll do, uh, you know, 90 degree turns and those kinds of things. But we used to think that they traveled in straight lines. We're finding out that they are traveling in a sine wave that when you put that onto an oscilloscope, it mimics the Schumann resonance and they're really not uh, going in a straight line. Uh, there is some kind of a strange thing that they're almost mim mimicking the, uh, the uh, frequency of the planet while they are traversing in their directions that they're going. I, I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but that's what we're finding out. I, I haven't heard that. I haven't heard no. that, but I can tell you there, there's, there's a lot to do with frequency and, and how our consciousness works and, and how this whole world works. I'll bet. Well, it's interesting that if they're doing that. If you've been able to measure that, it's, I think it's very in line with all the theories of what we call anti-gravity. And if it, that using those vibrational, it's just, I know we're going to call it an energy, but the way the propulsion is functioning, the waves that they're riding and on even a nano level, how it's, uh, I, again, there there are things. It's co I, I know um, uh, the theory of cones. Well, not even theories. The way what we found out about bees and the way they fly and the way that our eyes work and cone sh cone shaped uh, that the way a wave, the way the frequency is entering or exiting. And I know I'm blanking on that Russian that created that. Uh, uh, that it could rise and fall on uh, cone-shaped wave frequency technology, and I'm ah. blanking on the name right now. Okay. In other words, but, uh, that anti-gravity has something to do with uh, cone frequency as well? Yeah, I, I would think that these device, if these ships are flying in line <laughs> with an Earth energy grid, whether it's what we're calling natural now or otherwise, it seems to make sense. It's all of this... I mean, on one hand, we're talking about the past, and then now these ships, these cruisers that we're seeing, whatever they are, they're still part of this planet. It is not hard to not be present. It is easy. We don't, we brag all the time about, we know more about space than what's at the bottom of the ocean. But we miss things like giant redwoods that are like Hyperion. It's almost 400 feet tall, and no one noticed it until 2008. It was not known by... Wow. People. And I mean, National Geographic, you can look that up. If they called it, they named it. It's called Hyperion. It's 379 feet tall, give or take. And it's 60 feet diameter. And it's incredible. And it's in a forest. And we see a picture of it. If you look at it online, all the other trees around, it's like, well, that tree doesn't look very tall. Yeah, well, the trees around it are 100 feet tall. And they look like scrub bushes. And nobody noticed it. So for these people to still call this place home, or to be uh, living amongst, whether it's every UFO sighted location on Earth, whether it's like Titicaca in South America, whether it's the Bermuda Triangles, or again the you know the 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 Dragon Triangle, and you know basically there's one south of Japan. There's a Bermuda Triangle. There's other anomalies like in Alaska. Uh, there's different places that we keep saying, okay, well there's these. Uh, magnetic anomalies and there's always ufos or there's uh some activity in our history which gosh you know I, you would be the better person to cite that one out michael there's been too many instances of visual confirmation of not our technology so the question is well just because it says it's not our technology it doesn't mean that it's not a prior human civilization's remnant scrapped rebuilt redeveloped on a smaller scale, they retreat from a planet that was terraformed. And for the last time, for whatever reason, they didn't want to do it. And they didn't want to rebuild it. And dynastic people like the Egyptians and the Mayans and everybody kind of took over. And they retreated. But it still doesn't mean that they're not coming and going from home. Yeah. You know, that, that has always fascinated me, Jared. 
the idea that uh, uh, our uh, project, our our ancestors, you know, back uh, in eons ago, be be they Sumerian or Egyptian or whatever, they seem to have had a uh, a personal relationship with who they called God, you know, or gods back then, plural. And then all of a sudden, at one point, it seems to me that they just left. The gods just kind of took off, you know, uh, for a period of time on the planet. Um, and maybe that's what what you're kind of discovering as well, is that maybe they weren't gods. Uh, but maybe at one point, they, uh, they did uh, maybe move on or do something else. Yeah, and I think that the more we take the veil off of the mystery we put on it and just be, again, not excited, I think the excitement is knowing that these technologies, right down to not only growing soil, but the way they built metropolises, these uh, stone spheres, the technology under the very foundations of the buildings that we've taken for granted, well, it just must be really packed dirt. And we're not... Uh, once you lift that and we again address there's a big elf there's another big elephant in the room the paracas and it's not just the paracas these people have different suture lines in their skulls these are not right pressed board society so every day you want to get into biology well how do you not start with a complete human race that shows signs of being everywhere not just in peru and their skulls their spines uh their form magnum how their arteries go into their skull None of it's the same. So what, why would we not be genetically testing these mummies and really looking at the diversity of humanity itself before we start making assumptions that the guy with the beard who created a theory when women couldn't vote is right about Darwinism? For all those <laughs> good, good, succinct way to put it. I like that. <laughs> oh, my. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, that's fascinating stuff. You know, and, and the whole idea that uh, we might be getting closer and closer uh, to, well, I, I believe that uh, there are people on the planet, scientists, you know, uh, and uh, deep state operatives that know the answers to these questions. Uh, but uh, it's interesting to find out that uh, researchers like, like you guys are bringing this knowledge uh, forward to, to normal folks out there who uh, probably have always had these thoughts in the back of their minds, the questions that you've uh, raised, and now you're kind of connecting the dots for us. This is all a giant clue board. So it wasn't Colonel Mustard in Area 51 with a saucer. <laughs> it was your group with the measuring devices, the engineered soil, and a new map of the Earth. Oh, yeah. Colonel Mustard. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It is. Once we figure out how to connect all those dots, uh, I think it's going to be very, um, very uh, easy to connect the dots once we get well, to that point. I got a question for you, Michael. What if they don't? What if the what if the reality is that when I when I, I put it out my title, it's not aliens worse. It's us. Part of that is my question to you is what if all along starting with like the holy roman church and then eventually governments in modern times what if all they've done is accidentally stumble on high ancient technology that they have been aware of all along but what if it's not intentionally gifted to them what if it really is just accidental finds they are intentionally looking for them now they're well what if they're well aware of what they don't know and what if again there is at no higher governmental level, despite what we know. Well, there's the Eisenhower thing that you talked about and yeah. uh, the Canadian one. But what if our ancient human grandma, grandpa, they're not interacting with them. They're allowing, look, they find what they find. They're monitoring them. But other than that, they're leaving them alone intentionally. What if they're not, you know what I mean? Yeah. Is that, uh, well, I, I think you're, I think that's a great question, and I'll tell you what uh, I'm going to answer that with, uh, because I, I like to keep my feelers open for different possibilities out there. But um, there is an ex-career uh, CIA agent by the name of Chase Brandon. 
you probably have heard of him, a very famous author by now, who has written a book called The Cryptos Conundrum. And literally, it is about the CIA uh, and about a character in the CIA who ends up living to be about 150 years old and is kind of a uh, behind-the-scenes consultant to many presidents of the United States over the generations because he has learned how to... Um, genetically modify his lifespan uh, with this technology that he has found uh, through some of his uh, archaeological digs and all that kind of stuff. But the whole book, by the way, which was vetted by the CIA, it had to be, because this guy's a 30-year veteran, and you just don't write a book, you know, about the CIA unless you get their permission. It's about an underground civilization that lives in within the planet of uh, Earth that literally um, is an advanced uh, society. Now, why would a guy in the CIA write a book like that? Isn't that fascinating to think that, uh, of course, we've, we've had many indigenous tribes on the planet that say that they were, you know, helped by ant people or they, they came from the center of the Earth or underneath the ground themselves, you know, the Navajo and the Hopi and those kinds of things have those legends. Um, so you wonder if there is an advanced civilization that literally didn't disappear, but went underground. Well, that, well that's opening up a whole other can of worms, isn't it? Oh, it is. And, of course, then we've got Admiral Byrd saying that, you know, there was a... Uh, you know, uh, an area when he went to the South Pole uh, that looked like it was green and it was lush. And uh, he landed his plane there and spoke with German-speaking scientists when he got there. I don't know if you remember that story from his uh, journal that he wrote. Uh, and by the way, Admiral Byrd's son was part of Project Blue Book later on. He was an Air Force guy himself. Uh, and... Uh, was the one who came forth with uh, Admiral Byrd's uh, uh, lost journal about all that weird stuff that the fact that there could be, you know, openings maybe at the poles to the uh, uh, center of the, not the center, but at least under the earth. And and then we get CIA guys writing about the story. But, oh, man, you guys, this has been a fantastic show. I don't know. We got to do this more often as paranormal podcasters just jump on each other's shows. <laughs> yeah, you know, the whole hollow earth thing, I mean, we could do a whole show just on all the information that's that's there on that. We've talked about that on Conflict Radio. I mean, I'll bet. To, think that, to think that the core of the earth is basically the sun for them down there, and it's 24-hour sun, and I've talked to people that claim that there's dinosaurs still living down there. You know, they... they basically live down there with you know just in total peace and harmony and you know they'll they'll take their craft and come out and do what they need to do and then go back down and yeah it's a fascinating idea well and Ad admiral bird actually had a dinosaur sighting uh literally what he is he was flying to uh, antarctica uh in this lush area that uh, he it's in his journal i mean it's I, I assume that this journal is is uh, legitimate because it was touted by his uh, son, who is an actual Air Force uh, uh, officer himself. But uh, fascinating stuff, you guys. Listen, let's tell everybody again how they can get a hold of both of you uh, on Conflict Radio as we uh, get ready to... Uh, uh, well, we got we got at least uh, six more minutes to go, but uh, let's make sure people know how to find you guys. And and you're you're changing your broadcast times now uh, to Mondays and Thursdays. So we want to make sure that people understand that. Yeah, Mondays and Thursdays. We we used to go Tuesdays and Thursdays, but we're going Mondays to Thursdays now, just to try to uh, have a another day space between the two shows. Um, you know, every now and then you'll get somebody canceled or, or something will come up and a, and a show won't happen. But it's been, you know, two shows a week now pretty consistently. You can find us on www.conflictradio.net. You can also find us on YouTube. Just uh, search for Conflict Radio. 
And you can always find us on all all the normal podcast catchers, Apple, iTunes, Google Podcasts, you know, the, the like. And uh, Jared can tell you where to find him. Well, first of all, let's find out the time that you guys broadcast so people can check that out as well. Well, we, we pre-record our show, and then, you know, once the show is recorded, it'll go, you know, it'll get processed, and, and, and it'll go up. So the times vary. Oh. Normally, normally by 8 p.m. on Mondays and Thursdays, it'll be up. You know, sometimes we'll have an earlier show, like if I'm interviewing somebody in, in Europe, say, you know, I've got to, I've got to do an earlier show, so the show will be up later or, or earlier. If I'm interviewing somebody in California, you know, when it's 4 o'clock, eastern time or something the show might go up a little later so it just kind of depends you just got to keep an eye out for it okay wonderful i'm glad we clarified that yeah and jared we got to tell everybody where you can find they can find your book and other materials are you there jared i think you're i think yeah, maybe he i think you're muted or maybe he had a website. It's called notaliens.com. You can you can always go there and, and check out his stuff, notaliens.com. He has a YouTube channel as well. It's called Not Aliens. And if you go to the Conflict Radio YouTube channel, you can scroll down and find our playlist. It's uh, Jared Murphy co-hosted shows where, where we both co-host shows. We don't always co-host them together, but when we do, they'll go in a special playlist where he co-hosts for us. But you're going to find him at... Um, notaliens.com get an autographed copy of his book or you can find not aliens on amazon and you can get it for a couple dollars cheaper oh nice thanks for uh covering for him there obviously he's probably got something really important he had to do here the last uh, few moments so we'll we'll allow that to happen no problem and uh again uh mike uh, mike kubsinski and uh jared uh murphy you guys you guys are doing some good work out there. Um, thank you for all the um, information and knowledge that you're bringing to uh, our audience out here at Spaced Out Sundays. Uh, I'm, I, and I know that Dave uh, Scott at Spaced Out Radio, the uh, owner of the network, really appreciates all that you do out there as well. Um, he's out there slugging it out five days a week, you know, on the uh, airwaves out of Canada there. And really doing some great stuff. So it's kind of fun that we get to share our, uh, you know, expertise and uh, and interests together with other podcasters like you guys. So uh, any last uh, things that you want to say, Mike? No, I'm 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 good. Uh, uh, Jared's going to join me for a show with Olaf Phillips on the twelfth, and with Jennifer Deo. She's an archaeologist. She's going to be on on the sixteenth. I have a show tomorrow with Graham, Graham Phillips. We're going to talk about Robin Hood a little bit. And oh. uh, Peter Robbins coming up on the 19th. Oh, my. Wow, you got a blockbuster uh, group all lined up there. I, I love Olaf. You're going to have a great time with him. Um, and uh, fantastic. I'll be I'll be listening into those things as well. And obviously, uh, you guys uh, will be on our show immediately. Uh, we have been simulcasting uh, for this show on facebook uh as well uh on michael w hall the channel so as people have already been in the chat room all night long and really enjoyed it uh and uh now we're going to be on spreaker now that uh, the thing gets populated there as well so um thank you again you guys you guys have a wonderful week and some great shows coming up and we'll be talking with you guys next time whenever we can get back together so uh, right now, we're going to take a break and uh, be right back in a few moments. Once was a man who had some land in eastern Washington. And on his land, this man, he had a deep, dark hole upon. People came from miles around to throw their trash down in to see how deep the hole was and listen for its end. Then one day, that fateful day, they forced Mel off his land. They paid him off and sent him off down under with a plan. They hit Mel 
Mel's hole and covered it up so never it could be found. So no one would ever know what's deep down in Mel's ground. Yippee I Well, I want to remind everyone that Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thaw was the official music of Spaced Out Radio, <clears throat> rocking us in and out of every single show. You can find out more information and music at bumblefoot.com. A special thanks to everyone listening in at home and in your cars, at work, and in the chat rooms tonight, wherever you are around the world. Remember, the show is currently copyrighted by Spaced Out Radio and SOR Media Ventures Limited. Thanks for sharing your evening with us because together, my friends, we own the night. Good night, everyone. We will talk to you next Sunday.